Hello, let's see if this is working. Right then. E by gum. It's been one of those days today. Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Let's refresh this. Shows you how long ago I set that up. It's popped on and I heard already. Ah we go. Brew ships. Right then. So today's brew ships, what is it all about? Well, it's um, the normal brew ships, but it's also a bit more special because it's going to have some stuff about my dad in because his birthday was the 17th of July and I felt like adding a bit of him in. So, first off, hi, Sean Mack. Hi, John uh, J. Richardson. Hi, John Shea. Hi, Blue Shirt Buddha. Hello, uh, Albert Zapsy. Hello, Sean Mack. Hi, Bitron. Hi, Rich Hughes. Hi, J. Richardson. Hi, Bishon. Hi, Daniel Freeman. <laughs> hi, Richard. Oh, hi, Stephanie. Good Lord, it's hot out there. Hi. D -d 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 Long conversation going on there. Hi, Brock. Hi, John Shea. Hi, Martin Doherty. Hello, everyone, basically. How are we all doing? Hello, Drac Infernal. Hello, Drac. How are you doing? I enjoyed your video this morning. Hello, Eamon, and hi, Potter. Right, good evening, everyone. So, hi, Gordon. Now, you will notice this evening that some pictures are going to come up next to me. Those pictures that come up next to me are mostly some of the ships my dad built and also some of the things that he was involved in. So, you know. Hi Jonathan, hi Kilo19, hi Mike Mike. Hello everyone. And also today's top trump books. I haven't because I've been recording stuff for tomorrow's Indian Ocean 1941 to 43. I forgot to upload the list today onto the system. So I will fix that down below the description. The book the list of books will appear there on there. They might they appear after I've taken the dog for a walk this evening, so that's when I'll be done, but they will be there. Also, I had to explain a bit what are Top Trump books. They are a shorthand I use for describing books which people can read through and quickly go, ah, this has got better armor than that. This has got better than this. This has got better than that. And that's what they're for. That They're there for. They're a lot of fun, though, and that's not to say there's anything bad about them, but they are Top Trump books. And I said again, my dad's birthday was the 17th, so there's being sort of it's a combination of top Trump books and a bit of stuff about him going on. Uh, thank you, Brock. It's I think it's the second birthday we've had since he died. And it seems sensible to have this on it. It's Francis' fault. Please give him our thanks to your sister. Doing free, doing even one tour in Afghanistan deserves a thank you. Free. That's a very big thank you. Vision. My dad built this navy. Yeah. To an extent, that is one. Hi, Carl. So, that's what we have going on. We have the pictures coming up on the side. Now, today's Top Trump series is going to start with the ones which are always the strangest when I start to bring Matt's Top Trumps, which is why I've only got one out today for it, but I could bring more in. So it, Norman Freeman's books. Why are Norman Freeman's books Top Trumps? Well, for one major reason. 
they can compare and trust a lot of books, a lot of different types of ships, and a lot of different types of things. So, British submarines in two world wars is a classic example of that, and it's one of the newest ones of the treatments I have. And if you turn to the back of it, you find this very innocuously titled section called Submarine Data. And in it, there is lists of all the submarines. Stuff like this. Tables and tables of it. And it goes along quite nicely with the content like this. It's a beautiful book to read. As I always say with Norman Freeman, he does the massive works. He does the very big, very colossal works. And they are always lovely and worthwhile having. But you always have to remember, what is he writing for? Norman is a very big proponent of the US Navy. He is one of the US Navy's greatest assets when it comes to making the case for sea power for the US Navy and for its abilities. But this does mean when I'm reading some of his stuff about other navies, I always bear that in mind that what part of what he's doing is selling the US Navy by looking at that history. Hello, Night Heron Productions. So, worthwhile looking at, but hey-ho. It's good. Sure, Mac. And also, happy birthday to your dad, and thanks for the excuse to explain to my parents why I can't skip your live streams. <laughs> that sounds good, Sean. That sounds very good. <laughs> uh, you know, they are useful, and we do. I, I do do random stuff in these live streams. I do add in extra to them. Um, I have to admit, the one for tomorrow. Oh my lord, Indian Ocean. There's so many things which even I, you know, because you're studying other stuff, you forget and you go, oh my, that was there as well. And that was. And that was. And it's also fun because I'm not sure which mic was working when I was doing one of the recordings for it. So I might have to re-record it in the middle of the night. Which is going to be fun. But the thing is, Norman Freeman is not really that original. Hi, evening, John Luke. And when it comes to this sort of thing. And so I give you the Brassies, 1949. And because I know what some of you are like, the silhouettes of warships, and you can all recognize the top young lady. That is, of course, Vanguard, followed by King George V. Followed by Nelson and Rodney, followed by Royal Sovereign, followed by the Iowa class. That is a murderer's row, if ever you want one in two world war in a world war. Hi, Greg. It's also great for the top trumps. Because you can go. Well, that's all produced on the same scale. By the same authors. So same scale, same authors. Gives you a nice, interesting profile of these ships. What's also interesting is that listed here, I'll get that out of the way, because that's being used to mark something. Guess, look at the Alaska class and look what it's listed as. The Alaska is listed as a battle cruiser. I'm not sure if it's showing up on the thing there. Yeah, the autofocus works well on human skin, not so good on book print. Uh... Aircraft carriers. Ooh.
cruises. It's just, it is a very, very gorgeous book, and it is a lovely thing to read, and it is something worthwhile if you can get hold of a copy. And it has some beautiful pictures in it like this. Not sure if you can see that properly. Yeah. That is lovely. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous book. But it's Top Trumps. And it's worthwhile having. The Top Trumps are beautiful. They are some beautiful books. Um, and of course, as I was talking about the other day, the more recent versions you can get. Per what I always love is same number of pages. Same number of pages. But this is what you have to do to get it in quality in modern print. And yeah. Uh, by the way, those who recognize it, that is the Ark Royal. And that was one of the ships my dad worked on. He did a lot of random things in his time. He really did. If you're interested in the armoring of your ships and want to know exactly how much of a hit they can take, please consult your brassies. Where do you have a... Um... 19 inch big belt. Oh my lord. Yowza. HMS Canva. 7 inch thick belt. Plus, ooh, extra strength deck. Oh, very nice. Very, very nice. Canada. Uh, well, what we would call HMS Canada in World War One, what they called uh, Amrante La Torre in Chilean Navy zones. Lovely. Danny Freeman, the top Trump's books. What is missing is crew competence, e.g. Da Japanese damage control versus USN, as per Drakenfell's video. That is the trouble with all top Trump's analysis. Because the crew is always an X factor. So you can have two ships which look exactly the same. <laughs> Jay Rishan, what my ship was that with a 19-inch belt? Might have misheard. It was a proposed design, which is in this one. I think. Um, so there are some they have some of them, some of the designs which are being proposed. Uh. Mike, Mike, we have trouble. And may have, uh, you might need to go get your eyesight checked. I'm, I'm, I, I, I love your enthusiasm, but Nelson and Rodney are nowhere near the best-looking battleships. For starters, Warspite will want to have a conversation with you about that. The only Warspite, uh, only ship which arguably has plot armor in real life. <laughs> oh, yes, it's blame Canada. That would be a fun one. Right, this one. Royal Navy escort carriers. Now, why is this a top trumps book when it's only about one class? Well, there are a few things in it. Here, it's enough ships which it is actually able to be top trumps and what they get involved in. But also, it's kind of interesting because it shows the progression of escort carriers from... Let's see. HMS activity. Two. HMS Vindex. And all the ones in between. It's really quite beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Jerishan, for me, best looking sh uh, ships HMS Hood, the King G uh, KGVs, and the Holy Vanguard. Where is King George V? Usually he would be singing out about this point. Um. John Luke, Nelson class appreciative age like a good whiskey. Again, I am... No, sorry, no. If I'm going to be stuck in a battleship, it's going to be HMS War Spider or HMS Queen Elizabeth. I like something which survives.
Nelson and Rodney survive just about. Mainly Nelson survives, let's be honest. Rodney gets a bit... Ugh. Now, I know this is a naval channel technically, but it's fun. And Winkle Brown's books are just something I love. I've got two of them in this one. Um, this one is Wings of the Luftwaffe. I've got his Wings of the Navy one over here, but I've decided I'm going to do that. Say that for another day, um, because I might have some ideas for that. Because I I might have some trips coming up in September for birthdays, so I need some things to do some what I'm calling review videos, review series, um, perhaps a spotlight and review videos, I'm not sure what they're going to be called, which will take over the days which I'm away on trips to people's birthdays. I, my girlfriend's birthday actually takes place on a Sunday, so I, I'm sorry, there'll be some recorded videos for that day, but no brew ships. But this is a gorgeous book. It's got beautiful pictures in it. And the interesting thing, of course, is all put together by someone who flew them all. So it really is an excellent read. And it's if you haven't got it, it's worthwhile getting. Let's see what pictures come up now. Ah, oh, yeah, that's my dad. We don't look dad alike at all, do we? We really don't. Doctor, you should talk about the Fritz X. Hmm, I might do something like that. So listen, we fully understand it's time to come to us. It's not just family. It's, you know, it's birthdays. I, I, I like this skin attached. It's nice skin. <laughs> then we have Wings of the Weird and Wonderful. This is the most wackiest. <laughs> And it's quite cool, some of the stuff that he gets up to, and he's looking in there, and, you know, some of the things he gets he gets involved in. Some variations of the Sea Hornet. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but that nose looks very, very weird. That nose looks incredibly weird. Bell King Cobra. Ah, the list of aircraft in here. Variations on the Lancaster, Tudor, Air Cobra, Air Comet, King Cobra, Flying Fortress, Buffalo, Sea Mosquito, Sea Vampire. Then there was the Flexible Deck Vampire. Oh, I've got to show you that one. I have got to show you that. So the idea was you'd have an aircraft at sea on a carrier which would actually crash into the ship as it's landing technique. You'd have a soft sort of mattress landing and the aircraft would crash onto it. It's just... Hello, Gordon Eagle. What about Nagato? Um, we're talking about Royal Navy aircraft and the Royal Navy battleships. Nagato is quite cute, but I think by that point in those pictures, he doesn't isn't there. Um, You know, HMS Rodney got Bismarck War Spike in his arm out. <laughs> Rodney... yeah. I have to accept that, that that did happen. But to be fair. Eh. Rodney did get Bismarck, but with help from a whole load of tribals and King George V. And Prince of Wales and. Hood having done their part as well. Uh, 
I'm talking about Hello. Well, also Hello Golden Eagle. Um, can we have a quick list of top British, Canadian, or other ships to avoid if survival is your priority? Ooh, that could be a good thing to do in one of those videos. That might be. I might put that in one of those videos. But it's just My family doesn't really bother much too much with birthdays. That's sad. Mine gets really quite obsessed with birthdays. Danny Freeman, also a bow section of Eskimo good combat position to avoid. <laughs> yes, stern of HMS Nubian as well. <laughs> Enjoy, Brock. Take care. My impressions. Want me to relink footage of rubber deck vampire landings? Oh, if you could, that'd be lovely. Uh, but that is something which is really cool, and he does all sorts of things. He was the test pilot who did the rubber deck landings, and frankly, if someone had told me, you know what, Alex, today I want you to crash your plane, which is going to have no undercarriage, into a rubberized deck that you can land on, so it's nice and soft, I would probably have cried. And then thought, right, making my will. I'll go do this, but I'm making my will. Trent Lanko, do you have any resources in World War II Royal Navy electronic warfare capabilities and battle experience beyond jamming Fritz X and the Hench Lager 293? There isn't really much written about that. I will go and have a look it up for you, especially if you can tweet me on certain things. But, um,. The thing is, actually, the Royal Navy are fairly tight-lipped about their electronic warfare capabilities, even to this day, because it all develops them. Jay Richardson, happy birthday to your wife tomorrow. Thanks, Night Heron Production. Um, they are pretty darn tight-lipped. They always will be, but, you know, it ha uh, they sort of, that, that's what they're kind of like, because... It's all important to keep it, is their view, that, you know, you have to keep these things together and secure because they all develop off each other. Right. As we're sort of doing aircraft, there you go. The Axis aircraft of World War II, the Hamlin Concise Guide. It's nice and cheap and full of pictures. But it is actually fairly cool. And again, it backs me up in my usual point of it was not only the Royal Navy which was fielding biplanes in World War II. There were lots of other nations which were as well. Mainly the Italians, but also the Germans and various others. And it's quite cool stuff. Um, I like the Door 24 flying boats. I do like them. They're very, very cool. They do sort of remind me of a walrus in some of their imagery, um, Supermarine Walrus, and the way they look. But they have this sort of single engine look, and they're really rather cool. Carl Harmon, is there a video Wednesday? Just wondering if my birthday is Wednesday. No, uh, it's Mondays and uh, Monday and Thursday this week. But Carl. Remind me, and I will say happy birthday on Thursday. But happy birthday for Wednesday, but I'll also remember to say happy birthday on Thursday. John Shay, to be honest, on British ships like that, I like the, correct me if I miss and it say this, but massive superstructure of doom. <laughs> eh, possibly. Strub, what class airframe destroyed most subs in World War II? Hmm. Well, for submarines and anti-submarine patrol, it was the Swordfish was pretty darn successful. I think they were up there. And for class... Could well be. It's going to be between the Castle class Corvettes and the River class Frigates. Because they really do go on a hunting spree. So pound for pound, they probably take out the most subs. Uh, 
The thing is, as Danny Prima says, the question is that the right question? Job isn't to kill the U boat, but to get the convoy ships through. And in that case, it's the flare class, which are pound for pound the most useful because they just push the convoys through. Jay Richardson. Well, well, we're in a bit of a pickle. As before this, we were separated for divorce. In to take care of her, apparently, I have to. Yowks. Well, they do say no good deed goes unpunished, Jay Richardson. Sometimes it's by the system. Good luck, though. Uh, da, 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 da. Right in. Disruption Scrub. I guess Boo Fighter. Oh, the trouble is with the Bow Fighter is it gets a lot of the high profile kills, but it doesn't really get a lot of the patience kills. They do a lot of stuff in a localized area, but the trouble is they, whereas the Swordfish ends up taking out submarines everywhere, the Swordfish is in the Indian Ocean taking out submarines, it's in Southeast Asia taking out submarines, it's in the Atlantic, it's operating from all sorts of places for taking out submarines. There are usually more of them around, and the bowfighter is very in demand in the higher stress areas. So I mean, the swordfish is in the places where the submarines are often less expecting of enemy threat. Um, it's a swordfish which has fun with some in the Caribbean. Evening, Paul Johnson. Hmm. Evening, Carl Gansberg. Don't worry. And... Right then, let's get to some ships. We're motoring through these quite quickly this evening, but, you know, we often do. Janes. This is the British Battle Fleet by Fred T. Jane. I have volumes one and two. Very nice person produced it for me. It gave it to me. Um, technically, no, it's supposed to be 25 quid. But this was first published in 1912, reprinted in 1914. And this particular version is based on 19th edition, was published in 1990. And it is kind of like the Brassies in that it's the original Janes and the original write-up of their fleet. And it's got some beautiful pictures of ironclads and of other ships in here. And it's just sort of, it's just lovely. It's got, you know, the armour on Le Guer, the warrior and the Black Prince where their armour belt is, then the Hector... Achilles, Minotaur, and Northumberland, and where they're armoring, how they're armoring them. It's a really, really cool book. It's a lovely, gorgeous book, and it has some beautiful, beautiful pictures in it. And I have the second. I'm looking for volume two. I'm sure I put it out next to this one, but now I can't find volume two. Yeah. Oh, I've spotted it now, but I, I'm not going to reach today. Not today. You will hear me groaning and uh, all sorts of things. But it goes through the entire backstory of the Royal Navy, and it comes up with the modern one, and it's just some beautiful stuff in here. Where the armour is, what they're armouring, why they're armouring it. It's a very, very cool book, and... Honestly, if Drac's still watching this, he's probably currently going... He either has it and is getting it out and looking at it going, Ah, oh, my beauty, my precious. Or is currently scouring the internet going, I want a copy. Because it is gorgeous. And it's got all the sort of things in here. You know, Krupp steel. Steel hardened by a special process discovered and applied at Essen and then explains it. Um, all different types of steel. Minesweepers, mine layers, oakum... 
ocean going destroyer, all these things. Not the unit of speed for ships. The ship is said to be going X knots when she is going to sea, going X C or nautical miles in one hour. One C mile equals 6,080 feet. MB, the word not should never be used to indicate distance. See? Knots are not measuring distance. Uh, Golden Eagle, the Congo versus Alaska. Ooh. If it's a night, Alaska. If it's in the daytime, Congo would probably have a chance. But again, Alaska, if it gets in the first hit, uh, could do a lot of damage. So in the daytime, it depends who gets the first hit. At night, I go for Alaska. Daniel Freeman, the only Admiral Fisher says, why waste tonnage and armor? That could be more engine and more guns. Well, actually, to be honest, I would actually agree with... Well, I, I've just actually... I've recorded a video today which in which I've said that the way I would have fixed the Deutschland-class heavy cruisers would have been to fit them with 8-inch guns rather than their, own, their existing armament and uh, use the weight save for um, more powerful and better engines. Because if they could have had a decent high speed, then they could have done something more. Night Heron Production. Is the Swordfish low speed a factor in subkilling? To some degree, I imagine they were the kind of the seekings of the day, given their ability to loiter. Exactly. That's pretty much it. They could loiter, and they could loiter with anti-submarine radar. They could carry so many stores. That's the thing. They could carry a lot of stores. They could carry a lot of equipment, which would allow them to spot the submarines. And they could be used off escort carriers very easily. Trent Lenka, it is in the book, The Application of Radar and Other Electronic Systems in the Royal Navy in World War II, on page 191-228. That is a good book. Um, usually has quite a lot of stuff in it, but again, I find a lot of stuff written about electronic warfare. It still seems quite, quite an area which is opaque, and as such, it gets ignored quite a bit, more than it probably should be. Definitely more than it should be. Don't forget, right. website about U boat losses says ships 264 includes a few losses to merchant ships. Aircraft 250 includes all ship based aircraft, but also there are joint kills. Mine's like, yeah, it's all fun. In defense of Fisher, he didn't expect an idiot to command his beautiful ships. Bigger guns means you can shoot from further away, and thinner armor is okay. Mm, to be fair, that's the trouble. Fisher always expected to be in command of his own ships, pretty much. And that's the trouble. You can't really design that for him. John Luke, if you gave the Nelson class design to Jackie Fisher, what would he have done with it? Double the speed of the ship, or at a, at a minimum? At a minimum. Probably the length do. At a minimum. Daniel Freeman, half the fun of the chat and playing with active fight is the disconnections. Probably. <laughs> Jonathan, don't worry. There's all sorts of things going on. Uh, there is always sorts of different things going on with the chat and all different things. It's that brew ships is very much a relaxing discussion of books. This is a cool one, a lovely one, and where I answer some questions. Um, this is one of the ones which gets me into trouble sometimes for rec uh, for recommending because people go, ah, but, and I go, ah, but, back. So. I really like it. It's Destroyers of World War II by M.J. Whitley. I have a lot of time for M.J. Whitley's big encyclopedias. 
Um, this is called an international encyclopedia, and it does contain everyone. And the, that's the reason I like it, because it is the same author putting everyone's books in roughly the same format, in roughly the same standards. And as long as you check what they are saying, and you check their content, to an extent, because it's usually 99 times out of 100 is right, it is incredibly useful. Because it gives you an incredibly beautiful approximation of how these things do. It really is a true top trumps book for destroyers. And you can go through it and you can find some stuff which is frankly amazing. You know, I have a lot of time for the Lafori class and some of their pictures in here. But you also have a lot of classes in here which come through and it's just awesome. It's, it's just gorgeous. And nothing highlights just how aggressive looking the battle class are than when you get them in a map like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That is a cool picture. It is a good one. And it's a lovely book. I'm not sure how much it is on Amazon or eBay, but it's worth... It can't be much expensive because when I bought it in a bookshop a few years ago, it was about £15. And it's got chili. It hasn't just got the major powers. That's the thing that I love about it. It's got everyone in it. It's got... Um, let's see. Uh, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain... Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Norway, Peru, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Siam, Soviet Union, Spain, Sweden, Turkey, United States of America, and Yugoslavia. So it's got all those nations, it's got all their destroyers in, and they're all compared and control and they're all put next to each other. Which is just it's it's just beautiful because it allows you to look down and go around the world and go, hang on, where does this destroyer come from? Where does it really rank? Is there a reason for this ship? And you look around them and go, wow. It does. Golden Eagle, how to fix the courageous class battle cruisers? Turn them into aircraft carriers. That's the only thing they're really useful for. This one, here's a thought. Did the UK, US ever use subs for high value trade like Japan, Germany? No, they didn't need to. Never really needed to. Occasionally, you'd hear about them doing some operations where they're moving really high value, to, uh, really high value goods, but not trade. Calvin Gasberg, um, E W. I was surprised to know that that even the World War One Italian MAS were equipped with hydrophones and electronic sender engine for evading age detection, also by hydrophone. Yeah, there are lots of things going along. There are lots of systems there there to try and get them through. Jerison. Oh, it appears Golden Eagle is a little blocked. Oh, Jerison. Oh, it appears Golden Eagle has blocked me. Mm. I have no idea what that means going on. Uh, Nighthound Production. Are you aware of any U boat successfully damaging or destroying and attacking Allied aircraft with their AA guns? Yes, there were a few, a few U boats managed to successfully. There were even flak U boats produced at one point, which were all designed for AA defense. So there are a few times where they do manage to get a successful hit, but it, by and far and away, a submarine on the surface is not in a good place if it's caught by an aircraft, especially if that aircraft manages to attack with things which are not going to take much notice of flak. And remember, a damage to a submarine, anything which damages its pressure hull and stops it being able to dive, means it's out. It's a mission kill. And it's on the surface until something else turns up to kill it. So that's the big problem for submarines. They are always at a running at a risk of, ah, once they're on surface. This is why they usually, the moment they see an aircraft coming, they crash dive to get away from it. So it's very rare. They they only stand and put up a fight when they have no choice. 
So that's usually when they're already injured or they're already uh, they've got issues where they can't really submerge. So that's the thing. If they're on the surface fighting it out with an aircraft, they're already in a bad way is the rule of thumb. Uh, Tom Toronto, 1022 U-boats lost to Swordfish, 26 lost to Sunderland, 72 lost to Liberators, 27 lost to Wildcats, and 38 lost to Catalinas. Hmm, cool. I'm not sure about that U-boat number for the Swordfish, though. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. They had a habit of downgrading Swordfish-likely kills, so this is why I'm leaning on Swordfish numbers. But 72 lost to Liberators. Didn't realize that many. Hmm. Is that a castle of midships on the battle class? It's the way they've structured some of their, some of their organization does look sort of cashless like, I do admit, but that's mainly their superstructure. John, I can see that, but the Nelson class is much better looking than the two. Also, HMS sledgehammering towards Bismarck at 30 plus knots with a few troubles on her flanks. Mm hmm. Uh, Trent Lunker, Dr. Clark, I found a great deal of World War II UK RCM on Japan is in Aussie and Kiwi documents related to the General Carfer Section 22 Ellent and Radar Hunters. That doesn't surprise me. You often find, If you often want to find out about what British technology could really do, you go and read the American documents because they're all published, whereas the British are still going, yes, it's now been put together under the 50-year rule again. Um... My girlfriend has an excellent document she's been looking at, she's been hunting for, which she's found has been uh, re -sec uh, made secret again for another 50 years. And she's sort of going, I hate you all. Okay, right then. There's all sorts of discussions going on at the moment. Right, let's see. Uh, I'm right. In the Trump's book, how did the Perkins guys fall? I found them to be excellent resources. They are lovely. They are lovely sort of resources. I don't have any out here today. Mainly, I've focused it on the... Brassies and the Janes. And that actually brings me to the second Janes, because... I have what I call my Jane's flick book. And I've had a few of these over the years. Because you can do that with them. And flick through and see all sorts of different ships. Actually, speaking of different ships, what ship my dad's is that currently up doing looked at? Ah yes, it's another one of Ark Royal. Yeah, he did love working on her. He did. He he worked on lots of carriers in his time. He helped fix the Charles de Gaulle, and he helped fix, well, work with some Americans on some of their carrier designs. He did all sorts of random stuff in his time. Um, what I always love is there is a da the daring class in here, and it just looks so fighty. It's um, Peru's ferry daring class at the time, and that just looks such a fighty ship. And it's next to the cash-in class, and he's sort of going, yeah, you both look fighty ships. They do. Right then. Angus Sunner, using a sub instead of US and any of the would have spared the cruiser, but time is a factor as well as secrecy. Yes, and the, sub the cruiser could get there quicker. Uh...
And as Bishram points out, you can't really fit the components that the India Post was carrying on the uh, on a sub. It would have had to be a couple of subs. Don't try it. More than 120 aircraft and hundreds of men were lost in the fierce battles between U boats and their pursuing aircraft. The trouble is, Thomas, that some of those figures for lost aircraft, and this is the problem, include aircraft which went, this had just disappeared. So we don't know if they were killed by German uh, German subs, or if they had mechanical failure, or they got caught in storms, or all sorts of reasons why aircraft could have gone down. And sometimes you look at the list of the aircraft, and that number includes some aircraft which were lost in the... Bermuda Triangle. And you sort of go, well, yes, they were lost on an anti-submarine operation, but does that mean that they were lost because of submarines? It's the Bermuda Triangle. And there is another reason why I've been joined by this gentleman here, Roger. Um, I'm, not sure he was, uh, I'm not sure whether he was actually given to me by my father, but... Um, I do have this memory of my dad carrying him in when we were all staying in a travel lodge on the way down to Cornwall once because I had left him behind in the car. And I was about four at the time. Dad went out to the car and got him. Ben Ora, nice picture of Atreus Eagle. Always amazing how different she and Ark Royal became from each other. I think that's actually HMS Ark Royal. Not Eagle. Um, that's how Ark Royal started in life. Trent Lango, Chapter 10, I'll see him in this Department of Scientific and Industrial World War II. Oh, cool. He's online. I'll have to go look it up. Uh, Eamon, what were the Italians' plans to beat the Royal Navy? Um, pretty much the Italian idea for beating the Royal Navy was to try and draw in sections of the Royal Navy. It's kind of like the Japanese plans for the US Navy, but in sort of in Jap in Italian. Um, take sections of the Royal Navy and defeat them. So split the Royal Navy up and manage to concentrate so you have local superiority over... Uh, whatever force you're facing and take that out and then work it on. Uh, basically, the Italian plans for fighting the Royal Navy only worked if the Royal Navy wasn't able to concentrate its full might in the Mediterranean. So that's the thing. The Italian plan is entirely based on the Royal Navy having to fight a global war. The Italians, though, did have some plans for how to do it, and they were... The Italian Navy, do not be rude about the Regia Marina. They're actually quite good. They've got some quite good ideas and quite good thinking going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I I should point out some very nice uh, some of the very nice flotilla leaders from Discord have uh, volunteered for the moderator duties because of issues which happened last week. So they are now sort of they're taking that on as well. Very kindly of them uh, to help me because I was trying to moderate and answer questions and that causes a lot of delays sometimes in moderations and answer questions and so they've got this all sort of a, uh, this is an organization Jerison, did your father work in a specific area of naval architecture hull form and displacement or jack of all trades um jack of all trades although he did a lot on hull form and displacement and a lot on hull designs he was doug clark and he was very very good at what he did he did a lot of random stuff uh, new IKB 472, what from World War II would be worth resurrecting for another 50 years? Surely anything on the tech side will be totally out of date now, with the exception of nukes.
Let's get out on the train, but some of the heavy torpedoes. If you could modernize those designs, i.e. give them new engines and new sonars and mount them on ships, could be quite useful as anti long range anti submarine weapons if you had them. If you wanted to take out a torpedo submarine in one shot and you could modernize them to do that, you could do that. But um, really, things have moved on. I wouldn't mind some of the armor belt, though, occasionally. Hmm. Right then. So, I have three books remaining to show you all. And they are all from one series. They're all the Grange book series. Um... 21st century submarines and warships. Again, I like it when it's got everything not in nice stats. That's the thing I look for in Top Trump's book. It's everything's got to be similarized. They've got to actually standardize the stats and work them out so that you can put them together. And it allows you to get a picture of what's going on in the world. And I find it very funny when people tell me, oh, no, I don't read books like that. And I go, well, how do you know what else is going on outside your own area? You know, why not? It's fun. I prefer to know a bit more about what's going on in my, outside my own area than to just re, not uh, only read the really highly academic books in my area. As you can probably guess, though, I am a bit of a wanderer when it comes to the history. I do wander around. I don't. I have a sort of area, but I it's kind of it's large and expensive. Twenty first century warplanes and helicopters, and this is always cool because. There are some helicopters in here which are absolutely gorgeous. K-50. Hokum! <laughs> the uh, Kua, the most powerful helicopter ignored in history. Um, they're Reconnaissance stuff was absolutely critical to many of the American plans for operations. When you realize the sheer size of the Russian mainstay aircraft and its AWACS duties, and what they're looking at it for a successor, even bigger. It's going to be interesting. It is. There is some really interesting stuff in here. Um, this book was actually where I learnt the ES-3A had an aircraft called the Shadow variant. And the first 767 AWACS aircraft. Produced for the Japanese. It's a cool, cool book, and it's got a lot of interesting stuff in here, and it's worth reading. All right, then. Vision, when I worked at a hotel, I love finding and returning stuff animals to little kids so they lose them. Yeah. Now, it's always a fun thing when you can do it. Ron Sheard, as for British Radar, development of equipment for the Royal Navy 1939 to 45 is quite detailed. It is. Disrespectful. Chicken warmed nuclear landmine. We do not need to go to the chicken warm nuclear landmine. Emmett, that's the same idea the HSS. And, uh, interesting. Yeah, oh, cool. Paul Johnson, MJ Whit uh, Whitley destroys the World War II. Is 80 pound hardback or 27 pounds paperback on Amazon? This cost me 15 quid <laughs> in a second hand store. <laughs> so that's what I was facing. The price for me is still written in here. Oh, so yeah, um, it's a good book. It is worth having, though. It's a lovely book. It, I'd go for the paperback version if that's the pricing, though. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Johnson. 
Tom McBabel, the book Unbroken has a good perspective on the ratio of aircraft losses due to operational and training versus the enemy fire. Hmm, thank you. <laughs> Terence Lenka, regards, what or two tech that would be useful now? What or two high frequency communications? They would be useful, but we need to sort of have proper coding and adapting for them. Um, it, but I, I think we should get back into sort of developing some of these things just in case. But I really more is more a build chance topic. Trent Lenka, Auto 2 HF is immune to anti satellite weapons or deep sea drones cutting under sea fiber optic cables. You've been listening to um, Village Pumps, the most recent one. Dan Freeman. A third class of LCS designed for dealing with small boat swarms, proper literal, but give it severe uh, several inches of armor, lots of guns. Oh, yeah, it's a coastal battleship. That does sound what you're like you're designing. The new IKB 4472. Do you buy any of the Bimini stuff? My last was re secret blame autocorrect. Um, okay, when it comes to Bermuda Triangle, there is also a similar scenario in the Pacific. And the thing is, my theory is basically there is so much plate activity and earth activity around there that it can do all sorts of things to your compasses, to your navigation equipment, and all sorts of things you weren't expecting. And then there's methane and all these things which can come there. So let's put it this way. I think it's an area where you have a lot of these things happen that can happen pretty much anywhere else, but they don't. Uh, the trouble is a lot of them have happened there because if you have one, it probably disturbs things and causes another as well, to be more likely. So that's what I think with the Bermuda Triangle. And I think the water's just the right depth to really make it work and these sort of issues. But I, I did a lot about the Bermuda Triangle in Mysteries of the Deep. A lot of things, things came up for that. Surprise on long range swimming heavy air torpedoes versus long range rocket boost from VLS. Um, actually, it, you could probably put some of those big torpedoes on a rocket system, which would give them a boost as well. So you'd have a long range heavy torpedo with a rocket boost, and that would be uh, that would be fun for the submarines to deal with. And I see I, the reason I'm thinking about this is because I'm thinking if we take, if we start turning dipping sonars uh, over to UAVs, and we start with the option of having self-propelled sonar boys, which we can drop into the water and which will move slowly ahead of the formation, and then you drop some more and some of those sort of thing. Um, then actually having a weapon which can reach out and, let's say within two shots, guarantee killing a submarine, that's a good thing. And for that, you need a, a heavy weight explosion, in my opinion. You need to make sure that you're going to take that sub out. Preferably far enough away that the resulting nuclear explosion doesn't impact on your task group. Hmm. I'll leave that there for a second. Jefferson, Stephen Wilson, but they got lost in the Bermuda Triangle, though. Even if they made it out, they didn't make it back to base. That's the trouble. All right, let's try do you write on the chicken lamb? I was a terrible idea. Definitely. Just from, ah, but my general son is UK long range infantry comms are not renowned for, in reliability. At one point, there is a story in the Falklands War of a unit trying to communicate back with the units aboard HMS Fearless, and actually. Whilst they weren't being able to be hear, heard by the units receiving on HMS Fearless, they were able to be heard perfectly in north in um, northern Germany. So what was actually happening was they were talking to northern Germany. Northern Germany was calling up Fearless on the satellite 
uh, call and go out passing on the information. They were bouncing incorrectly off the atmosphere. It happens. I knew IKB four four seven two. So what World War Two stuff is still worth keeping secret for the next year to fifty years? Probably a lot of the electronic warfare spoof jamming stuff. Because the trouble is, that's the base point you're starting from. The more you know about someone's base point, the easier it is to project where they are now. So that's why we keep some of these things as, as silent. In the case, is there a book that deals with Fisher Beresford feud in detail? Um, Massey's Dreadnought. That goes into it quite heavily. Um, Lambert's Admirals goes into it quite heavily. Pretty much any book which focuses on Fisher has to deal with the feud quite heavily. And Matt Cook, going back to the topic of hiding things in warehouses, what about putting ships in museums under private ownership? Do not recall, don't remember the idea come up. It did come up, and basically the lengths you'd have to go to to designate it as a private, uh, as a museum, and as the Japanese had to do with some of their ships from Tsushima, etc. Um, it's quite heavy. Quite a lot of concrete was involved. Hmm. Daniel Freeman, uh, just clock. A UOV sauna boy dropper plus torpedo. Looks at fairy swordfish, looks at requirement, looks back at swordfish. Do we need to make it unmanned? Maybe too true. <laughs> to be honest, a swordfish you could probably make unmanned quite easily. They have that simple of uh, flying surfaces and controllable surfaces. You could probably make an unmanned version of the swordfish without too much energy. Um, and they had really, really reliable engines. If you could produce an engine that uh, as engine based on that as reliable as that was today, you'd be very, very happy. Um, I'm sure, Mike, a spearfish or ad cat for cat would be a nasty surprise or something. Yes, they would be. I'm just saying that even nasty surprise would be a um, 21-inch high-explosive torpedo laced with some alkali metal uh, metal in the explosive. Yowza. Hmm. How do you think small drones, i.e. small civilian ones, will affect future missions? Uh, Pre-boarding, scanning, search and rescue? I think they could be used for all of those things, but I think it's, are they going to use them? Because the trouble is, and this is the thing, when you're talking about civilian drones and a lot of these systems, and people go, oh yes, this drone, it only costs $50, da 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 da, -da this. But the scenario the military are looking for, well, um, do we want to be using it to scan a potentially terrorist vessel and have it easily jammed? We don't want it to be. We don't want to have the terrorists be able to take quick control of it if they're on board. They might not be, but you need it to be, just in case they are. Because the trouble is, the what-if scenario for the military, for the Navy, is that much worse. So that means you're going to have to build in a more secure comms unit, which is probably going to make it heavier. You're also going to want more endurance, which is going to make it heavier, which means you're going to need more powerful engines to keep it airborne and give it the same mobility, maneuverability. And that's going to make it sort of, it's going to affect its size. And this is why the military, the naval version of the civilian drone ends up being so much more expensive and so much more than the civilian one, because the requirements for the civilian one are, I use this to check buildings as I'm a build, as I'm a building surveyor. Yay! If someone jams it, well, that's an annoying, hmm? but it falls out of sky, I pick it up, and I do it, give it a go again, or I do it manually. It doesn't matter, people aren't shooting at me. There isn't the risk of that. I'm not relying on it to make an assessment. <laughs> I'm not about to send people into a potentially life-threatening scenario 
based on its survey if it doesn't work. Hmm. People who design designate things as man portable seem to really be the rarely be the infantrymen who have to carry this off. This is my point about Commando 21. This is why I want the Royal Marines to have an 8x8. That is all I'm asking. I will even accept Boxer over the US Marine Corps APC. Because it's just no. And yes, I know they're going to have helicopters, but honestly, helicopters are great for rapid insertions. But if you want a unit to be organically mobile and be able to take their equipment with you, you don't want to use a helicopter. Because the long lesson of Black Hawk Down and all the stuff in Mogadishu is, and you're probably going to end up with your small force in an urban area. If you're in an urban area, you need to be able to bug out, and helicopters are not really great for bugging out in an urban area. Vehicles aren't that massively good either, but honestly, helicopters are a lot more um, problematic. Helicopters are good for providing overwatch for the vehicles and for dropping off the initial team. But the extraction team, vehicle-based, and whew, the helicopters provide fire support for the vehicles, getting out, clear the roofs, etc. Trent Lanko, Jerison. German operational level ground ops use near vertical in incidents shock a sky wave and for their operation mover over to um, out to four hundred with satellite. Mm, cool. Just sure, Mac, the clock. So like a cluster bomb type thing for torpedoes. Yes. Ooh. Nick uh, uh, Nick Aswell Rice, the Ilbit drone watchkeeper is based on and is being procured by HMS Co HMS the Coast Guard. Mm, yes, but again, that's Coast Guard, and in terms of the British Coast Guard versus, again, uh, when you hear Coast Guard, especially if you are looking at in the context of the American Coast Guard, you think military organization, practically, practically second navy. Uh, the British Coast Guard is more police orientated. Than the U. Uh, and they they they're more civilian orientated. And again, there's a difference if you're the police versus if you're the navy, and at sea dealing with counterterrorism. If you look at the coast guard in Britain's case and counterterrorism duties, it's usually if we suspect it, call fishery squadron, and river class shows up with thirty millimeter pop pop, uh, and uh, with its thirty millimeter cannon and um, probably some. Specialist Royal Marines on board to go and say, Hello, we just came to say hello. Hello, have you met my friend Mr. Gunn? Please behave. Oh, what have you got? Oh, yeah, one of the subs my dad worked on is now up. An Oberon, I, the O class. Dad loved the O class subs. He liked the nuke subs as well, but he would never tell me which classes he worked on on those. He just kept that quiet because he felt that was. What he should do, but he um he did work on the O class and he had a lot of fun with them. He had a lot of fun. Hey, Stafford, don't worry. Uh, come on, guys. Small pizza payload civilian drones. Not just that they lag military spec comms, but they are they really hate winds above 60 kilometers an hour. Smallest drone for military naval application is around the Sable S100. I'd agree with that, roughly. Do Doctor, could we use drones as a type of trip up? I can see someone's going to try to, but really it's not going to be that effective trip up. Because as lessons of the Gulf, etc. will tell you, taking out a drone just doesn't... It isn't cause a cause spell line enough. Um, the Iranians shot down an American drone and instead of Trump, and this is Trump, who is 
way, way more aggressive than Obama ever was likely to be when it comes to foreign policy. Um, you've basically gone from Obama, who was talk, talk, talk first, to Trump, who is knee-jerk reaction, then talk, then another knee-jerk reaction when things don't go right. It's fine. But if even he isn't going to do anything over you shooting down an un a drone, the odds are no one is. So, unfortunately, if you ain't got boots in the ground, it ain't a tripwire. So, that means you're going to have to send someone. Which is why I get worried for the Royal Marines and the Commando 21 and the concept of going really, really light. Uh, Night Hammer Division. It was an O class. It was one of the ones my dad worked on. Hmm. All right. Weather can affect helicopters. Armor on station is very useful. Yes, it is. I uh, knew I could be forced into I think that Drakenfell's video on the A600 mentions that the radio was rendered almost useless by variations in the Earth's magnetic field, and sunspots in the uh, Borneo area could explain Bermuda. Yeah, there are lots of things that can explain Bermuda. I think the thing, as I said, I think a lot of things happen there, and that's why it's got a name, because it's quite a heavy traffic area, so, you know. Mm. Sure, right. Coast Guard is the small navy because we have two armies and two or three air forces, depending on how you count it, so why not have a second navy? Yeah, it does work. Thanks on it. Royal Marines are very polite shock troops. <laughs> Depends who's in charge of the unit. If it's a sergeant major, they're less polite. <laughs> Slightly more lethal. If it's a captain, they're probably more polite, but just as lethal eventually. Um, genuine, a book called A Very Victorian Feud by Richard Freeman is all about Fisher vs. Bereford. Having read it, uh, heavy reading, but available in digital form. Yeah, good luck with it again. I... I I prefer in many ways the... I, I think the Massey one is good because it puts in context and the Lambert one is more my style because it puts it in the context of who are the other admirals and is this a normal thing? And actually you find out that the fisher Beresford feud is something which is made a lot of, but it isn't exactly unknown for admirals to have feuds which go on for years and years and years. Sure, Doctor, can you explain for uh, the US Americans what the uh, RN Fishery Squadron is? Okay, so the RN has the longest running fisheries enforcement squadron in the world. And basically, it's what we nickname our patrol boats. So the river class patrol boats, the OPVs, um, they're all they're mostly grouped together in the fishery squadron, which is their sort of a mission administration unit, and it's traditionally called the fishery. And they are Whilst we have the Scottish have their own fisheries department and Welsh, and I think the, the English occasionally use the border force for it and all sorts of things, um, the Royal Navy maintains a fisheries squadron, which will technically do fisheries duties, i.e. have a reason for going up to ships of, are you fishing ship? Are you doing this right and monitoring that? But also are you used for counterterrorism, but uh, sea patrol, watching the Russians when they go past, all sorts of things. So they're basically our patrol boats, but we call them the fisheries uh, fishery squadron because the fisheries squadron has been around forever, and they they're grouped into that. That's how we command them and control them. So Britain technically has well, whereas it's kind of interesting. The Britain technically has three coast guards if you think about it, because we have the border force, we have the coast guard. And we have the Fisheries Protection Squadron. And then we also have the Scottish Fisheries Squadron, which are Scottish, uh, owned by the Scottish Government and aren't armed. But they are basically a Scottish Maritime Patrol Agency. And all sorts of random things. 
It's just fun. Sean Mac, and let's be honest, we're totally flying it over to territory at some point. We're probably, you know, you're often flying things over Iranian territory. Everyone does. And I don't think we managed to persuade them that we mostly harmless drunk medical and vet students. Um, good luck. I mean, should Third Commander Brigade become like the New Year's MMC literal regiments plus a bit of raiding? The army can provide a light infantry brigade if necessary. Uh, I doubt it. You see, the thing is, the US Marine Corps are talking all this stuff about becoming literal regiments and these sort of things, but that's what the US Marine Corps can afford to do because A, they're so big anyway, they're still going to have quite a lot of inertia and because of the logistics and things they have behind them. For Britain, the Royal Marines are our sea-based force. They're going to be the ones operating from the sea. They're going to be the ones expected to provide the entry for the army. This is the other thing, because I have a feeling that at some point, the army are going to be, want to be deployed somewhere, and the army are going to find themselves going, well, how do we get this equipment? Well, if we've got rid of Albion and Bulwark, it's going to be a very short case of, um, right then, so, uh, well, we're going to have to seize a port. Oh, goody, how are we going to seize a port? Bay class, land as many as we can, cross fingers. Um, it's going to be interesting uh, because if you want your strike brigade to go, because the, when you're talking the army, they talk about a strike brigade, they talk about it as something which can be used in Africa, around the world, for wherever Britain needs to. How's it going to get there is the question. And so it, it depends on us having an ally who allows us to land their force, and that might not be the permissive case. That was the entire reason the Royal Marines had Fearless and Intrepid, had the LPDs. Even in Norway, during the Cold War, with the, uh, fighting the Russians, they were expecting possibly not to be able to have a base they could land it into, the amphibious, uh, the amphibious task group and the troops the brigade into, because they reckoned the Russians might take out the ports. Even if the, uh, Norway wanted the British to land, they might not be able to let them. It's the same with anywhere else in the world, but it's it's going to be an interesting thing. Mike, man, Mike, Mike, special about the Cod Wars when? Um, maybe in time. Probably when I'm feeling more fishy. <laughs> hmm. Ooh, new IKB 4472. Does anyone know where I can find a model for the Italian R-Class submarine to World War II? I think you have to kit bash that, and I think you have to get a very large submarine model of the Italian Navy. Oh, what's the larger one you can get? Uh... I was actually having this conversation on Discord the other day, so I'll have to look it up. Evan, were there any design studies for KGB class with all their armament forward like Nelson's? Uh, yes, there were... No, no, and no. Jerison, paratroopers and air assault brigade. Oh, don't get me into it. I'm even more worried about the paratroopers than I am about the marines. At least they're going to have a helicopter. They're going to have a ship carrying all their equipment not that far away within helicopter range. The poor parachute regiment is probably going to get deployed somewhere without anything anywhere nearby. And then someone's going to stick up an SA-11 or some derivative of it, and we're going to have going, Okay, right then, you guys are on your own. Good luck. Um, I'm just, you know, sitting there watching going, Oh, no. Trent Lenka, uh, Dr. Clark, what do you think of the China Iran Agreement Treaty? Plan and plaf bases in the Persian Gulf. Sure puts the cat among the pigeons. Not really. Because China has to supply them. And if you have forces. The thing for the Chinese, the real big problem for them is their main advantage and the main way of getting around the tech advantages which the Western powers have is concentration of their forces. So they have mass. The more they disperse their forces around the world, 
the more they have penny packets which could be picked off in any war. Which might not get them the wins they want. Their idea is it will soak up allied forces to try and take them out and think it shows their power, which it does in peacetime. It's about finding the peace. It's good strategy for peacetime for them. It's not a good strategy for wartime for them. Kilo 19. US Army has to use a device to fill radios with all units frequencies, and they all have to be in time with each other's work. Oh. Daniel Freeman. Uh, the clock. My understanding, reading the key use for the strike brigade is to be able to drive self-employed quickly to Poland Baltics through Channel Tunnel. Everything else, permissive landing. That's their definitely hope, and that's it. But again, um, don't take this the wrong way, but the Channel Tunnel, is that able to be found on Google? And if I was the Russians, is it easier for me to fight a British brigade when it arrives, or is it easier for me to block the Channel Tunnel? Probably easier for me to arrange that the Channel Tunnel is blocked, especially as I know when I'm going to be doing the operation, and it doesn't probably take that big a team. We're talking a couple of guys and a mortar on the back of a truck. Could probably do the job. Or a drone, or mounting a small drone that flies in there and blows up. Anything that causes enough, that causes enough damage, it takes it out for a few days. It doesn't have to be long. It just has to be long enough to delay the arrival. You see, that's the thing. It's a mission kill if it delays the arrival. So that instead of those reinforcements getting there within a couple of days, those reinforcements don't get there for a week. Well, that's enough time for me to have, uh, to have bedded in and made a defensive position. Stratford Thompson, so Cod Wars will be a Friday special then? Ooh, maybe. Maybe some sort of special at some point. <laughs> I'm being nice on that one, but I am laughing. Uh, Jay Richardson, it is large, but the issue you have is the larger your territory, the less concentrated and less forces you can send. Russian armies are large, but not for its ter territorial size. Yeah, that is the other issue. Trent Lenka, I expect a China. When we next do our next China episode, remember we do an episode on China once a month. Once a month. We basically go to Jamie, fine, you can do it. I think the next one is scheduled. We did it episode five, so the next one's episode nine will be the next China one. Or ten. Vanhome, hi. What's the talk today? Today is brew ships and top trump ships. And I've got the final top trump book sitting next to me. And uh, chatting a bit about my dad, which is why we have his pictures of some of his ships beside me. And yes, that's another one of his class, which he, classes which he worked on. At Camel Lads. There's all sorts of them there. They're all listed. Uh... Jerison, Dr. Clark, a few years ago, there were more Marines than Paras with jump wings. There still are more Marines than Paras with jump wings at the moment, as far as I know. Also, one of the Marines I know is a former Para. Yeah. The Royal Marines are very, very obsessed with making sure they're all jump qualified, because it's part of their training they use now for helicopter assaults and vertical assault, is to go do their helicopter training. So the Royal Marines really get into that. Um... Strub. People say amphibious assaults will not happen again, but what about airborne assault? Well, this, this is the thing. If amphibious assaults won't happen again, then airborne assaults are definitely out. But the trouble is, amphibious assaults are always out until you need them. Remember, after World War One, everyone was going, oh, after the experience of Gallipoli and all this, there'll never be another amphibious assault. World War Two comes along. Um, you know, the trouble is, most of the time, you don't need it. I, I, I do agree. Most of the time, you don't need equipment. Which is why I often suggest, well, actually, these pieces of equipment, uh, they could be crewed by reservists and put in reserve and activated yearly for an exercise or a couple of times a year for a major exercise so they get the training. But 
otherwise they're simulator trained and they're reservists. In terms of the ships, the Marines will need to be more uh, more regularly, big ships, because you don't need to do a big amphibious operation that often. But when you do need them, you really, really do need them. They really, really do matter. Because you don't really have any other options. Uh, Derek Freeman, just thought, you need to explain the Cod Wars Friday special to the cloners. Well, there's a tradition of having fish on a Friday in some of the European countries, and I think there's also occasionally in parts of America, uh, as it was one uh, inherited from monasteries and various traditions to keep the fisheries going. So if you're going to look at the Cod Wars, which was a little conflict between Britain and Iceland over fishing rights, um, it's appropriate to look at it on a Friday, which is the fish day. Preferably while eating fish and chips. Uh, sure, Mac. My feeling is that when the US Marines deploy, you know they are the meanest unit on the field, which is why I, think, I really think Marine tanks should have been reduced in number but upgraded to step centers. Eh, it's tempting, but actually, I'd say I would be more interested in getting a direct fire version of the APC, the 8x8 they're working on, because that looks cool. And I think for their doctrine, that would actually be better to have a safe deployment. I think the trouble is to make the new tanks up to their standards, into those standards, would make them so heavy that actually the Marines, they don't really fit with what Marines want to do. They, the weight they are costing them and where they're going to fight. It's more a case of, right then, what we need. And if you look at traditionally, US Marine Corps tanks have always been on the lighter end of the spectrum. They've always kept them lighter and mobile because they want to make them as amphibious as, as possible. Um, so I think, really, the USMC are looking for a modern LVT more than that. Okay. Paul Cameron, do you think China's naval influence in the ocean is a good idea or a mistake in the long run? Do you understand the synchronism, antagonism of India? Latter. Because the Chinese choose to be strong in the Indian Ocean because of their supply routes. The Indians have to be strong in the Indian Ocean because of their needs. And if you're antagonizing India on the border already, then that's going to make India very upset about you being in their ocean around them. So, you know, welcome to the jungle. They're going to be racing into you. You have to choose whether you're going to compete or whether you're going to drop out. New IKB 4472. If the armed forces are worried about the government cuts, maybe they should encourage some retired officers to run for office. I have been saying this for many years. Strub, Doc, do you think do you think any nation will massively increase the size of its merchant navy? Not at the moment. Vision, the Battle of the Channel Tunnel sounds like a good action novel. It could definitely be interesting. Thatcher wanted to get rid of the paras. No, she didn't. Um, there is lots of talks about what Thatcher wanted rid of. Most of it's twaddle. There is all sorts of things. There were all sorts of studies being looked in, rather like now, and people lump on them. It's like, no, there are all these things being leaked, and people are going, yes, there's this official study, we're just doing it. Yes, when you're doing a defense review, you look into all sorts of wackadoodle options. You do. You go to full gamut. And then you work down and go, well, that's wacky because of that. Well, that's wacky because of that. Dum, 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 out, out, out. And you come, hopefully, to a sensible point in the middle. Hey, Chris444, Channel Tunnel, couple of synchronized car truck bombs and you're sorted. Sadly enough, yeah. Um, this front and all, speaking to your dad, did he have a favorite ship and why, if you know? Um, I think he was rather attached to different ships for different reasons. He was attached to HS Montrose because he got to take the whole family around her. He was attached to Ark Raw because she was the first carrier she got to launch on. Oberon... The O class, because um, that was the first time he got to go to see in a submarine. He had different attachments to different ships. And I think he rather liked uh, the Malaysian, I think, patrol ship he worked on. Uh, Fisheries Protection Patrol ship, because he had all sorts of fun sorting that one out, including a huge fight with a gentleman, because, um, let's put it this way, that gentleman, uh, he found one of the people he was working with had ordered already a diesel engine for a fisheries per fishery survey vessel. And of course, that was incredibly noisy and not going to work and also not going to fit in the design. But apparently, um, he had a relative involved in it. So my dad kept his tongue quiet, quiet, right until he was in front of the very, very senior prime minister. And I think also the 
king of Malaysia at the time. I'm not sure. I forget the story. Anyway, the rulers of Malaysia. And he brought this up, this diesel engine, how it was going to ruin everything. And they went, why have we got a diesel engine? And the guy was forced to admit it. And anyway, the guy ended up being fired. But my dad also went, mm-hmm. And got his way with his engine. Evening, Tony. Hello. Uh, Jay Richardson. Q19, did you know on the back of the M19 Claymore it comes with a warning not to eat explosives inside? That really doesn't surprise me. Um, Nighthound Production. And the IKB 4472 also would depend on the scale you're aiming at, but if you're modeling at 1700, uh, I reckon an Ashima one. Uh, I-119 might make for a good conversion base. It might do. Um, Bailonora, on the scale of... Scale of uh, Bailonora, on a scale of we won't, eight, we won't wait to 1996 white paper, how is the current review going to, going to go in particular for the RN? I have no idea at the moment. I am listening to all sorts of different people telling me all sorts of different things, and I am just trying to be honest and put forward a good case. And I am avoiding... Any temptation to get drawn into tit for tat negativity about other services? Because hi, King George, um, because I see that as the stupid way to go. And when I see people attacking other services to make the case for their own equipment, I go, "You are being an idiot." That is the best way to undermine funding for our new room. Donald Freeman, uh, rechannel tunnel attack. A permanent KO of the tunnel will be a big escalation attack, given how long it took to build. Yes, a permanent K knockout of the tunnel. But a temporary knockout of the tunnel to stop your brigade getting through, well, that's almost justifiable. And honestly, again, you're talking about Russia. Mm, they might not care. Jay Richardson and King George V, Jay did try and sing your Hedrimus Hood song for you, King KGB, but he didn't have your voice, doesn't have your top range. Mm. <laughs> Emmett, what's wrong with all the KGB having all for, on all forward armament? Because it stops them being a balanced ship. Yes, it's great that they would have all their armor forward so they could fire in profile and blast, blast, blast. But again, when you're talking about the Nelsons and Rod and Nelson and Rodney, because of the way the guns are structured, you can't actually fire all forward at once. You know, you've got one set here and set here, da 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 da. And if you've got them all firing forward, it just you've got this thing in the way. So you'd actually, if you wanted to have them all capable fired forward, you'd have to have boom, 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 strapped up like the front of a dido. And um, yeah, that's just gonna be oh, especially if they're all quadruple turrets. No, no, far better to balance them out. Carl Armand, Dr. Clark, should the RN have Corvettes? Um, I do regularly play, make the case for a slightly up-armed um, river class or a, a, a variation on that, but that's usually before more as a present ship to supplement the Type 31s in a global reach mission. A global presence mission. Strub, Doctor, do you think nations will ever expand to World War II sizes? Well, if there's World War III, I'm sure they will, though. That's it, basically. If it looks like we're heading towards World War III, expect massive expansion very quickly. Um, Harrison, that's a nice boat. Which one is it that's up there? Ah, yeah. My dad's one of my, some of my dad's proudest ships, the ferries across the Mersey. He helped design them. And as he was from Liverpool, that meant a huge amount to him. That was one of his proudest things. He was so happy to have been involved in that project and working on them. And they're now building a new generation of um, ferries. They're looking into it. But it's he was really, really proud of the ferries across the Mersey. And I actually got to travel in. I uh, finally got on one uh, not that long ago, thanks to um, going up there and seeing my girlfriend. So that was a lovely trip. 
it's funny to think we'd always planned on going as a group and we never actually managed to make it up to Liverpool um, to go up there for that. And so, yeah, that was fun. Mac, Dr. Clark, uh, not really. It was the USMC doctrine that caused the continued development of the MO3 head of the tank. I understand that it was, and I do agree that it was, but actually, if you look at their, not so much the doctrine as they talk about and sometimes they plan based on, but their actual realities of how they operate things, they tend to end up wanting light ones. And one of the interesting things about the MO3 heavy tank is that they're pushing for this heavier, heavier tank, and they only want a small number of them. Because uh, they really want them, sm they want that as heavy tanks because then they can have their main tanks be as light as possible. And you're sort of going, uh. Sarah Thompson, Dr. Clark, have any of you uh, looked at a steel block to deploy to the South China Sea as their favorite maneuver so far as ramming? Um. Why do you think certain navies are now looking at icebreakers with such love? Ram my icebreaker. Uh, sure, Mac. Marine Corps doctrine is always to bring in a lighter tank there in the first wave and then have something heavier back it up. Yeah. But the trouble is the light tanks that they are light tanks are now getting to the point where they're the same weight as the heavier tanks, so they can't go in the first wave. And you can't afford to have both. Vision. In politics, you can take an extreme position to get something else by making it look like the reasonable option. Example. Amtrak friends to end an overnight uh, uh, to end overnight trains to get more money from Congress. There is always so many things that are pushed in like that. Hmm. Come Gasman, Marines armored vehicle. For a degree, uh, one can get away with lack of armor protection, BMD and BMP style, but not with a lack of firepower. Yep. At a point, it used to be the case that the USMC used uh, the old gear. In some respects, it's still true here. Yeah, it is still to an extent true with the USMC. Vision. In politics, when opponents love ABC and you want M&M, &M, it's sometimes best declared you'll love XYZ. Yes, so you can compromise on M&M. &M. And always be careful, because they might be saying they love ABC because they want M&M &M as well. Kilo 19, uh, King George V. Yes, it is. Kilo 19. Due to budget cuts, that they say something, sometimes get the hand-me-downs. Hmm. King George V, did you hear about the Admiral Kuznetsov modernization again? They're trying it again. Someone needs to tell the Russians to just let the poor ship die. It's been trying to kill itself for the last 10 years. Just be kind to it. Build something new. If you really are into it, go to some other nation and get it built. China's building a whole load of carriers at the moment. Go buy one from them. Get made in China like everyone else does. Um, Kilo 19, if World War III went nuclear, don't think much will be around to expect. Well, this is the point. Will it go nuclear? The thing is, World War III was predicated on the idea of things going nuclear, but why would they? Yes, you have nuclear weapons, but everyone knows the moment you use your nuclear weapons, everyone else will use their nuclear weapons. The only chance of a World War III really going nuclear is when only one side has nuclear weapons and can use them to get a great advantage over another side. If both sides are going to use them and you could end up destroying the whole country, uh, whole planet, is it worth it? And that is the question. It basically becomes a nuclear standoff, which is another reason why I don't think that the F-21 is a great weapon. Because every time the Chinese talk about using it, I go... Yes, but you're relying on us thinking the moment you're firing your ballistic missiles, oh, those are just conventional warheads which are heading for something we don't mind you destroying. Rather than those could be nuclear warheads heading for something we really do want you to, don't want you destroying, so we'll launch our own. That's the trouble. You launch a ballistic missile, you're launching a ballistic missile. Um, 
Turn on the pen pod. Okay, so how's this top trumps going to work? You two ships in a category? Well, that's what you pick when you're doing this one. This is warships and submarines of World War II. And it's got all sorts of things in, including, I know, all your favorites. USS Texas, next to South Dakota. So you can always do the South, the the, the uh, type. Texas is a dreadnought, whereas South Dakota is a battleship. Deck armor um, on the Texas, it's two and a half inch. On the South Dakota, it's one and a half inches. Uh, the length, well, the Texas is shorter. Uh, but the armor on the turret is 18 inch on the South Dakota versus 14 inch on the Texas. Crew on the South Dakota, 1,793. Crew on the Texas, 1,054. Seriously, the Yanks do love their heavy crewed ships, don't they? They really do. That's like my favorite small ship to look at is the Miltimar class. Mm, they're quite nice. So, Tom, why would they replace them soon? They look to be in good shape. What's the span of the Mersey Ferry? Uh, not that long distance, but they have been in service for about 40 years. In fact, maybe 50. I'm working out when my dad worked on them. Could be back in the 60s. They could be 60 years old. Um, but they have been well maintained, but they are now a bit old. Um, Eamon, I can see. On KVGs, what do you think of Ricklew and Dunkirk gloves? They're very nice for the French. The Ricklew and Dunkirk gloves, they are very sensible for the French. You go, I have to draw the sloop from Sing Townsend. I go, strongest attribute. Courage. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Little four inch pop up. I will fight. <laughs> have you seen the size of what you're up against? Oh, they could at least give me a single torpedo. <laughs> US military has known light tanks. I think they're currently working on them with the uh, 101st Airborne, aren't they? I think I seem to remember they're looking at the air for their airborne, they're looking at it, and the 101st are currently trialing it, but I'm not sure. Now, new IKB 4472 is a plan for the troops to be railwayed through the channel tunnel or for them to drive themselves through the main bores or the service tunnels. If the latter, then blocking the tunnel gets hard. I think it's the former. I wouldn't be surprised because I doubt they've got anything that could fit through the service tunnels. Uh, and if they're driving themselves through the main balls, I, again, that could be quite problematic. Um, mm. New uh, Night Heron Productions. I hereby, uh, I hereby christen this icebreak patrol vessel USS Come Up Me Bro. Or in the Royal Navy, Royal Navy case, it would be HMS, come on if you think hard enough. Um, quite literally. Trent Lengo. So UK, US Marines need an amphibious 20-ton robotank. Make it 25 tons and we've got a deal. Um, I think the Stingray tank uh, from 1980s had a limited production run. Doubt the machine tools are still around. That's the sad thing. Right, let's see. Mm. That's another nice looking vessel from Jay Richardson. What's the cover popped up now? Ah, yes. That was one of my dad's favourites as well. Winter Castle. She was rather a fun one to work on. He liked a few of them, and he liked a lot of them. He had a lot of fun with them. They were good ships. Ah, that's some of his papers he published. Uh, as you can see, he wasn't exactly um, unpublished, my dad. 
Uh, and he was quite ahead of his time, if you consider some of the dates where the things came through. Um, he's talking about automated ships in 1987. He's talking aided ships and their design in 1986. Yeah, he does get uh, quite a lot of stuff going now. Ships of the Future Design Issues in 1990, Singapore. And he was on the BBC Panorama. Uh, Shumak, you're not going to get a super carry out before the ship literally decides it's done with all this suffering, etc. Um, no. Sure, Mac, you mean the AGS, the, the BA won't die? Why would BA let it die? It's going to be fun. You let something die, you might lose the funding stream. Eamon, what the sign sacrifices did the USN make to get those nine 16 inch guns on the South Dakota and North Carolina classes? Was it speed and protection? And uh, Morse protection. There's a reason why the. Texas actually has thicker deck armor. They tried to angle things and all these things to try and make up for it, though. Vision, you can't drive through the Channel Tunnel. The railway tracks prevent that. Ever seen a car or truck drive down a railway line? They get stuck very fast. That is the big issue I was thinking about going through the main bores. <coughs> Does the RN need to risk offending people and make an HMS Eskimo to take to South China Sea, either an icebreaker type or just with kamikaze bow. Could be fun. Gear uh, 19. Modern tanks, you, uh, tanks, US Army doctrine evolved. Was, it, was a bit confused. Uh, Kaham, should the British have brought an amphibious version of the Centauro armoured car off Italy? To use if the Marines have a 105 millimeter gun. Um, actually, no. If I was, if you see, the thing is, Nicholas Drummond is the guy on Twitter who's always pushing armor, and he is very, very good. I don't agree with some of the points he makes about the Navy sometimes because I think he think he gets rather short sighted about the idea that the Navy is something that he can just take stuff out of and then he can use that money for the army and the army will still be able to do all its jobs. Because I have a feeling, nicest way, the amount of history that is the Royal Navy um, pulling the army's <clears throat> things out of the fire is quite sincere and quite heavy. But leaving that all to one side, he uh, he's very good and he's very committed to the boxer and I can see all the choices he makes for the boxer but I'm still of the opinion that if I'd been in charge the British Armed Forces would have gone in with the US Marine Corps and be buying their 8x8 APC and have been structuring that round what we need because A it's being built it's newer and B it would have been given us an amphibious capability and I would have built it so Britain had three strike brigades as I put in my dream fleet because we'd have had the Royal Marines with this vehicle, and then we'd have the army with two of the brigades with this vehicle. So it'd been two brigades which were strike slash amphibious, and one brigade which was amphibious slash strike. So if necessary, we have an amphibious strike division, which we could deploy to where we needed it, and I would have built it around these vehicles. I wouldn't have had... Ajax would have gone into the cavalry regiments, but I would have built three brigades entirely around these vehicles, rather like uh, the US built around Striker. Um, but I'd have built them around it, and I would have built everything on this platform, and I've gone, right, and what can we put in there in terms of fire support, gun, anti-tank, missiles, gun, what do we need uh, fire, uh, What do we need for APC, medical, command, everything would have gone on that system. And that's how I'd have built it all, so it was all basically using the same base. 
And then also, of course, if the nicest way, if the enemy took out the Channel Tunnel, well, it'd be a case of go to the coast and see you in France. Because they could self-deploy across the channel. <laughs> that would be a thing in the case of... So, your choice is, yes, you will you will hold them up for a couple of hours if you take out the Channel Tunnel, but what's the real point? Because all you're going to do is going to make them cut, arrive in France anyway. You're not going to do more than buy a couple of hours. Danny Freeman, I guess if the Channel Tunnel has taken out, we have almost more ferries than the Russians have submarines to sink them. Yes, but the trouble is the submarine, the, the ferries are um, probably full. It's going to be a lot more complicated to arrange for the ferries, and it's going to be a lot more delayed in terms of traveling. Um, King Griffith, sorry, if I said this last time, I remember the first time I came here, I spanned Atrium's hood. Then you were like, that's essentially Atrium's hood, Atrium's hood, Atrium's hood. Good times. Hmm, I know. Mm hmm. Trent Lunger, Thailand purchased a total of 106 Stingray light tanks in 1988. Hmm, that doesn't surprise me, Thailand. They usually do get some interesting kit. That's on stock clock. Uh, would the next tech gen tech is still be a little ways away? Would it be worthwhile to bring back the conventional big guns, uh, 6 and 12 inch, to fill the void until the new tech tank rolls out? Probably not, because if you consider how long ships are in service, by the time you'd actually get them in service, it would probably be time, and uh, halfway through their lives, you'd be paying uh, paying them off to build in the new ships. Hey Amen. You can make a lot of jo um, very mean jokes about the Iron saving the army. Um, British Somaliland. If anyone wants to look up that one, that's another case in 1940, no less, from the Italians. Which the British army always sort of goes, well, yes, we're fighting the Germans. They were the scary ones. Either the British Somaliland. Yeah. Mm. Carl Armand, I can imagine a group of amphibious APCs going over. I could see a large escort or small ship Dunkirk in reverse. Potentially. Could be quite a fun. Kilo 19, not a big fan of strikers. I can understand that. They are first gen of what that really capability is. We're now looking at second or third gen. They're a little bit different. Staff Thompson. Also, in regards to the commando becoming ultralight and your use of the SAS to explain to me, uh, explain to Jamie, uh, aren't they already the SBS? That is a branch of them. And honestly, if I start talking about all the different special forces to poor Jamie, he starts looking at me going, why? You have so many. Your armed forces aren't that big. As I was saying, the thing, I think we already have, we have the S Special Air Service, the Special Boat Service, the Special Reconnaissance Service Regiment, and I think we have a fourth one, but I'm not, I can never remember its name, but I do think we have something else. It, it, we're not that massive. We have four. We're obsessed with them, in a way, and, and most modern militaries are at the moment. Um, To transform. Here's the thing. No one in their right mind would send the, an army via the tunnel. It's asking for catastrophe. The trouble is that's in all the plans. Jerison, got the box. Uh, God, the boxer is such a cop out. It lost. The previous competition was actually disqualified. Speaking to German soldiers, it really decided. It's like I think the favorite was the VCBI and Terex. That wouldn't surprise me. Uh, remember, the procurement is always as much about politics as it is about actual capabilities. Strap Thompson, Doc Clark, was thinking uh constructing the hull for the old mounts, be it being able to pull in, drop a new system for the firstborn issues testing. It's viable, but that's really what they should have done with the Zomots. They really should have done that with the Zomots. They should have just put in a sort of a conventional eight inch or ten inch gun and just said, This is gonna be holding place until we can build the new system. Jerison, the Duke of Acosta, uh, Acosta in the Ethiopia Company is a seriously underrated commander. Bingo! He was actually very good. Um, Shomak, you should tell him about the US. Each service is like free special. Don't get that. Uh, look, I don't want to cause poor Jamie to have a panic attack over this. He, he doesn't. He's Australian. He's used to fairly straightforward logics on the special forces uh, scenario. They have all their own particular issues, but on the special forces, they are fairly straightforward. <laughs> Dude, don't get me started. Um, 
New IKB 4472. Big army trucks should be able to manage driving over along railway tra uh, tracks. Tanks. Eh, you would hope so, but no, actually, they'd probably muck it up. Ah, yes, thank you. Dino Freeman, Dr. Clark. Four Special Force Unit. Special Forces Support Regiment, based on various things. I think they're, an RA, they're a para -R raw marine combined unit that supports Special Forces when they're in the field and they need heavy firepower to back them up. Right, I'll be back in a second. I'm just... Someone's called to call me. Oh, book's going flying. <laughs> That's some good news. Right. So, sorry to disappear, but I had something I had to quickly go confirm. It looks like I was telling a lie earlier when I said China is going to be episode 9 of the bilge pumps. It will probably be episode 10 now. And the reason I say that is because episode 9 of bilge pumps looks like it's going to be an amphibious warfare special. If everyone goes plan because I've just confirmed a guest member of Bilge Pumps who will be joining the crew for our first ever guest on Bilge Pumps. And it's someone very, very special. Which is why I had to disappear for a second, because I had to go and confirm it, because he's not one of those people who I'm going to get back to later. I'm going to deal with him now, because he's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not getting into the RAF regiment comments. 
Um, I once had an RAF regiment come, a guy come to a, a school event um, when I was in my secondary school, and he was going on about the RAF regiment and saying they were at the front of everything. And, um, yeah, I managed to survive for so long before I started asking him questions, and he didn't really like it. That was when I was 17, though. Basically, he was saying, oh, the RAF regiment were at the front of the advance, and I was going, you were calling in, you were part of a combined team. You were the forward air controller. That's great. It's really important, and I am, but that's not really an RAF regiment team, is it? You are the specialist attached to the team. Uh, it, it, you're saying that it's the RAF regiment team. It wasn't really, but, you know, you know. Ammon. It is Commodore Michael Clapp. Yes, that is who we're going to have. Free, so coming out in three weeks' time will be an amphibious special, if all goes to plan, with Michael Clapp on as the, um, as the guest. So, uh, yeah, there is going to be... It's going to be the first one. And it's going to be looking at Amphibious Warfare. Because at the moment, Amphibious Warfare, if you consider... We've been talking about it for the last few minutes. We're all talking about the Marines and what's going to... The big thing, and this is the interesting thing when I hear the, a lot of the US Marine Corps concept and a lot of the concepts going on, people aren't talking much about the ship side of Amphibious Warfare. They're talking about the Marine side. And the trouble is the ship side is just more... At the moment, Jamie Specials, let's get on the topic to give Drac a heart attack as well. There are several we can do. Um, New IKB 472, railway track can be fixed real fast when it has to be, so you would need a big enough bomb to damage the structure integrity of the tunnel itself. Yeah. Or make sure the power lines go all mucky. Um... Darren Freeman, uh, Strub, I think it's delicate infrastructure op for operations now, CT logistics that are vulnerable to special forces raids, whereas before things were clunky but robust for the most part. Mm. Hmm. Vision, fixed damage would be faster and easier than driving over railway track in diesel trucks. Hmm. Any news of the mighty jingles come? Not yet, but that's not my one to work out. If we have jingles, that is Drax to work out. <laughs> Drax is friend, so Drax is the one. I had the job of wrangling Michael, Cla of politely inviting and persuading Michael Clapp to come join us. Um, and I will probably get the job of other people like that at certain points. I, I am certainly going to try and work on if we do a history one on seeing if we can't get Andrew Lambert to come along. Uh, I have Prof Lambert on there because I think that would be interesting because in the case of Alex Drac, um, sorry, uh, I do know how much he loves Andrew Lambert and also how much he it really respects Michael Clapp. So it's going to be interesting. Him and Jamie and Michael Clapp is going to be interesting. And add in Andrew Lambert, it could be there, there could be a, a great deal of hero worship going on. I might be the tough question of once. <laughs> Staff Thompson, any LH6 news? Well, the U.S. Navy is talking the good talk, but I think the more they talk, the more I think it's not going to get rebuilt. I think the more I think it's going to be given an honourable demise. Seven Wilson, since zap the vehicles into freight trains, send through the uh, through to blockage, then offload in service tunnels. You can They won't fit. That's the trouble. You're talking about military vehicles. The service tunnels, the largest vehicle they're designed to fit, is a cab. Um, they have all sorts of special vehicles. They're not going to fit the military ones. The military ones are too big. The thing of Thatcher was miffed that it had to be a railway, not a motorway. Um, she wasn't so miffed. She thought a motorway would be more efficient. When she was shown the evidence that a railway would be more efficient, she was happy with a railway. 
Jerish and Dr. Uh, Dracula, you're both Alex into naval history and both drink iron brew. Jamie has been over this with us in one of the Bilge Pumps episodes. It is, um, he has an interesting time, let's say. Bernard, interesting to ask about naval diplomacy with his service in the Indonesian confrontation. There will be lots of interesting questions for him. I'm sure about it. He thinks it's going to be about 90 minutes. I have a feeling I'm going to be late for my lecture that day. I might have to arrange cover because I have a feeling we might end up going on quite a long time. Because I know Michael. He, he, he says, oh, I'll do it for 90 minutes. And then three hours later, we're still talking. Kilo 19, scrap it and make it a reef. I think that's what they might end up doing with the Bonhomme Richard. They might. <laughs> uh, if it was so much easier, hey, I'd have, you know, it, 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 that uh, Carl Harmon, your idea of me being Drac and Drac being me would make life a little bit easier. But no, no, we are separate people. Although I have to say, the more and more I talk with him about the whole medieval reenactment stuff, and the more and more I look at various people on YouTube who do it, the more and more tempted I do get to go along and join him. Could be a lot of fun. Canada 19, I think the ship would have had a better fate if, if, if the fire occurred at sea. It would have that. It's going to sound strange. At sea, all those things would be locked down. There wouldn't be all the uh, constructor stuff, the contractor stuff around the ship. There wouldn't be doors taken off, all sorts of things. Basically, in harbour is the worst time for a ship to have a fire. You A, don't have enough crew aboard to order, and B, the ship isn't shut down enough. And you have some, you have the all the fire suppression systems turned off, usually. Second was the first they will go over be a chair for in detail. That is they will do. Jerison, challenge two is one meter uh, two is one meter too wide to go on the channel tunnel, or at least uh, to be allowed on the channel tunnel, so it may actually fit. Yeah. Then I'd happily join you in trying out Dracula's medieval reactment thing in Croydon. Yeah, that could be a fun. New IKB4472, there are diesel locomotives that are cleared for the Channel Tunnel and railways are hard to destroy. There are some World War II US training videos on YouTube showing trains jumping foot plus gaps in rail. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, but we'd all prefer not to do it, especially not with a whole load of people involved. I don't know, full crew with fire control at sea. Yeah, always better. Come on, has USN damage suppression got worse? It no, it hasn't. It's actually very good. It's just it was turned off because they were doing the maintenance. Yeah, to be honest, considering the roots of my family, most of us were probably um, more using longbows than plate armor. My family seemed to come from a long line of um, <clears throat> gentlemen of the sea, let's put it that way, and gentlemen farmers. Occasionally, a few of them even had the title of knight, but they don't seem to do much fighting on horseback. They seem to turn up when the kings and queens of England want something, um, let's say, a little creative done. Very creative. Ah, Dad's up again. I do like the way it goes round.
Sure, Mac, we need to separate them with all the views into one person. <laughs> uh. Vision. Uh, New York, yes, just requires advanced planning, so, so, so work can be done fast if war comes. Damage would be less of an issue than flushing out Russian specials in combat in and around war. Oh, don't get me started on that one. And the real problem would come as if they destroyed a train on the tracks. This is the thing. If you blow, if you cause the damage of a train fire on the tracks, that would take it out. It could do a lot of things. Yeah, both of the families on both my side. Um... <clears throat> Correct, uh, gentlemen. Let's see. Are you talking about Grell? Uh, no, uh, I'm talking pirates, or technically privateers, as they had letters of mark, and then Royal Navy, and various other issues. Basically, it, 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 my family get pretty nasty in certain scenarios in the history. Uh, they do turn up and do nasty, nasty things to some people. They're not ones who torture anyone or anything like that. They'll just turn up and kill everyone. Afternoon, Jeff. Hello. Hello, turning 3434. I haven't seen you before uh, today. Um, thank you My ancestry seems to have spent a long time as agricultural labourers in Warwickshire, so I'm not sure uh, they would have been high enough in the pecking order to get a, st uh, a stick, let alone a bow. Um, probably they were trained on the bows, because everyone had to do archery. Everyone had to do archery. It wasn't a choice. It was a case of, on a Sunday, you went and did archery after church. That was one of the reasons why England was so scary to fight, because they always had more archers. And yes, they weren't all as good, they weren't all as great, but you didn't need to be that great to be an archer in the mass. You need, if there were good archers with you, and they would be the few of the Lord's, uh, the Lord's special archers. They would be the retinue archers. But... The, the a vast majority of archers, especially if you're talking about North of England, and if you're talking about Scots coming in, the vast majority of facing would be mm, the peasants called up and told, "Bring your bow, it's time to fight." Hmm. 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 Starting a fire in US, uh, USS Miami. Oh, that sounds not good. Uh, yes, Bidrin. Yes, yeah, starting a train fire would hold tunnel for a long time. Have to do both balls to block both. Yep. This France one. Oh, I know. Fitted chair mail is pricey too. Unless you make it yourself. Then you have the much more reasonable fabric armor. Yeah, um forget what that's called sometimes, but the fabric armor, and that was far more common in that time, and it was fairly good. It was fairly good. For, in, this, in, in the scheme of it, it was better than nothing. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, who is the chap with the beard? My dad. Astrop, Doctor, do you think the U.S. Navy on the PR side? Uh, uh, do you think the P.S. Navy of PR is on the PR side of the fire? Uh, I think they're definitely doing as much PR as they can at the moment. Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Wilson, Doctor, I have a friend who took out three knights of a quarter staff. Those sticks were useful. They were very good. Derp Squad, Astrop, to this, uh, this. Would be interested in your answer. In 20, 1920, you have been hired to design a new navy from scratch for a Northern European navy, but you're a traitor. Nothing that would get you caught. Simple. I'd design everything for speed and all the air defense mounts on the British standard. 
so they could go up to 40 degrees or so you know or less um so no that that's how you get caught you, you know just design them so that they're all fast so they've got no armor and they've all got um low angle air defense mounts air attack mounts so they're all designed to deal with torpedo bombers not dive bombers that's your problem that that's your navy done and if you want to make submarines weak you just make sure their batteries aren't well like are, are um how do i put this in problem uh, aren't easy to replace and repair so they go bad quickly Go here. Uh. Mm. Carl Hammond, Dr. Clark, best archers for Welsh. The entire Northern England and Cornish would disagree with you. I can see. Uh, Gamberson is the padding, I think. That is correct, Jameson. Probably too much for this chat, but did England go from archery on Sunday to license for telling jokes? Aeon 1003. Why did Nelson run from Karlsakrona? No idea. Honestly, none at the moment. Um... Airman, was your family a Cavalier family or for Parliament? <laughs> My family fought on both sides. <laughs> both branches of the family fought on both sides. One side sent the first son to Parliament, uh, to serve Parliament, the second son to serve, uh, serve the King, and the other side swapped round. <laughs> Dirt, interesting. Drac went for massive torpedo bodges. Oh, that's enough, boy. Slow them down. Yeah. This is My family, at least at some point, rode high as upper peasants, yeomanry level, but I'm not sure how it was like more than 200 years back. I haven't looked into it. Mm. Sure, Mac. At Dr. Clark, armor is way more effective than you think. Hmm. Yeah. I know. But... My family used to make a killing taking down other knights and selling their armor and ransoming them. There is actually the, my dad's family, especially has a family Bible, and it goes back several, uh, quite a long way. And uh, yeah, pretty armor like Drag has used to be. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. Did you get knocked over? Oh, we'll borrow you, take your armor now. We, we have some we can sell it to. Jeff Beeler, my ancestors in the military were almost all soldiers, including both World Wars. 1812, Peninsula of France, America Revolution, and way back, a chap named Lord Rivers in the War of Roses. Oh, cool. So, no, oh, Wilson, you need a gambeson under your link mail anyway. Being hit with link mail on a no padding is very painful. That I cannot testify to, but that was one of my earlier experiences with random stuff. Ben Laura, my family most likely being Coventers in the Civil War. Probably. And it's always a good fun thing to do. Jeffrey, Jeff, my military history goes unbroken back to the Peninsula War. In fact, I'm the first British born member of my uh, In fact, I'm the first British born member of my father's lineage. Hmm. Cool. Same wasn't. Uh, Dr. Clark, yours was not the only family to do that. Yep. We were very successful at it. Had a lot of fun. And then there's the whole Scottish branch, of the, uh, the, the Scottish side of the family, which was even more interesting. You used to spend more time serving the English crown than the Scottish crown. Why? Because the English crown paid on time. The Scottish crown didn't. And occasionally we get paid by both sides. <sighs> when they're feeling really friendly. Uh, 
really, really friendly. So, any other questions today? Uh, the Ranters were the coolest faction in the Civil War. I'm not really sure they were a they were a faction, more just a group of ranting people. There again, we have so many rant. They would nowadays they'd be an online Twitter mob. New IKB four four seven two. A train fire under the war under war conditions. Then the driver might just be mad enough to put the hammer down and trying to get clear of the tunnel itself. It's only one thirty one and a third miles total. So no derail, no stop. Um, possibly. Depends on where the fire starts. If the fire's in the engine. Hold on, so Scott's not parting with money. You do surprise me. Uh, what's next week's bill? Uh, this week's bill trips one. We've had two this uh, previous week, but this week's one, um, I uploaded it. <sighs> Only yesterday. Let me open that. Da, 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 da. Bilge pumps. So, bilge pumps coming up is Bonhomme Richard, Ships and the Strategic Damage Control, and which battle should be made into movies. A fun mixture. And thank you to everyone for the likes and the sharing and all these things. It's real, it's really nice of you because it's really nice to get them. Doctor, why do you think um, more army officers enter politics than naval officers? Uh, because army officers get more exposure to politics. Naval officers tend to be away at sea. Naval officers tend to wander around the rest of the world. Army officers tend to be in the UK, so they tend to get involved more. That's the trouble. Sam Thompson, was Ransom rated by weight in store and little uh, a store and title or a stone title or just title? Um, we used to do it by how much could they afford because we considered it a sort of um, farming scenario, my, my, especially the Cornish branch. My family considered it. Uh, if you ransomed a merchant for so much that it put him out of business, he'd never come back again. Whereas if you made it viable for him to pay it off, then you could capture him again when he comes back. It's a sort of farming. Same with knights. You don't want to make it so expensive that they can't actually come back. They can't actually um, come back. And that, that's why you don't harm prisoners. You take good care of them. You feed them. They're worth more alive and in good condition. Brendan Rohn, who is, in your view, the best practitioner of naval diplomacy today? Best practitioner? Fudge. The Danish and the Canadians are quite good. The Australians are, quite, are trying quite hard. I think the Russians are probably uh, possibly up there at the top of the moment. Um, it's the Western navies. Most of the big Western navies are really not that good at it. They really haven't had to do it in terms of naval diplomacy uh, for a while. They've just been going around their friends, and they're now having to work out how to do it because fight because waging peace is far more complicated than waging war. Hmm. Uh, what is the current view of sea mines in this day and age? Uh, that we can use them, but we're not going to build them until we need them. Because we don't want people to know what we can to build. And we don't want them to know how to improve it. Vision. A few months ago, reading about Bonnie Prince Charles and his best friend was fascinating. His forces failed to take Edinburgh and Stirling Castle, despite them being defended by, pen uh, by pensioners. But also, you have to remember, a pensioner in that time is different from a pensioner today. A pensioner means an experienced soldier who's on a retainer, but is sort of retired. So they will not be as old as we'd think of pensioners today. They're someone who's basically on retainer. Retired, but on retainer. 
Paul Ketchum, probably too big a question, but if you could have dragged a 175,000 ton German fleet after World War I for the Washington Naval Treaty, what would you draw from their surviving post war? For surviving post World War I ship, uh, what would you draw from it? Honestly, again, this is the point which Drac made very well. It depends on what navy you are. If you're the Royal Navy, what you can get in a treaty from the German Navy isn't really worthwhile because you have enough of your own ships it, because of the logistics and the issues of supporting infrastructure-wise. If you're France or Spain or Italy, it might be worthwhile. They might be enough ships that it's viable. But it's what's worthwhile because the trouble is again the pace of technology has moved so fast through world war one that a large chunk of the world of the german navy built prior to or during world war one is actually out of date this is the interesting thing with the royal navy if you consider the cd and e classes even the progression between them well by the time you get to hms enterprise you're practically building a cruiser which is almost world war ii level C is very good for World War One level, and D is an intermediate period, intermediate level, which could quite easily be adapted to World War Two level if it, the time had been a timing had been right. But so, if I was France, I'd have probably taken their cruisers, especially their more modern cruisers. But again, it's how much is useful. If I was the Americans. I might be tempted by some of them modern battleships to save me building my own. Same with the Japanese. I might be tempted by some of their ships to save me building my own, building them my own. But it would be a, it's going to be at a cost of things, especially once the Washington Treaty comes in and stops you being able to replace these units. You're going to be stuck with these older ships. Whereas if you've got treaty allowance but you haven't got those old ships, you can build new ones, and that's better. Also, it stops you being able to support your own shipyards, your own infrastructure, your own technology groups, and that can cause problems. And, you know, you must remember the Washington Treaty caused huge problems in Britain because it caused the armaments industry to really run out of a lot of steam. Admittedly, part of it was a normal end of war curl that uh, roll down, you know, uh, standard uh, standardization, but. You also have this building gap, and if you'd had German cruisers as well and German ships as well, you'd have had even more of a building gap. You might not have got Nelson and Rodney and those sort of things in. So it's actually it. It's not so much what would I, why would I. It's not so much what would I want. It's why would I want it. That's the big question. Vision, how would the Channel Tunnel affect World War II if it had been there? Uh, the British would have blown it up. It would have made evacuation. That would have been nice way. The Channel Tunnel would have been where the British would have been evacuating towards rather than Dunkirk because you could have just brought everything back and you could have brought all the equipment back. But it would also have to be blown up. It would have to be blown up the whole way through to make sure the Germans couldn't get through. Paul Johnson. Would any of the other older frigate classes or soups be uh, soups be used today instead of the OPVs, for example, the Whitby class? I'd love to use them, but they're very convoy, they're very crew intensive for it. So it's probably better to have the modern sloops. Vision, I don't, yes, they used them as garrison forces because they didn't have to march, just hold out and defend a well-fortified fixed position. They weren't, there, yes, but they're not as old as you think. They usually, most of the pensioners were sort of in their 30s to 40s, probably. They're old for your line of infantrymen, but they're good, reliable ones. Yeah, feel like, yes, I'm possibly descending the Woodvilles. Oh, good for you. Uh, non you should read If England Were Invaded. I am engrossed in it just now. It's an awesome book I wrote in 1910. 
Uh, it's an interesting book. I haven't read all of it, but I have read some excerpts of it. Jerison, Julius Caesar was ransomed by pirates. They took a liking to him after he threatened to come back and kill them all, so they gave him an additional couple of days to receive the ransom. He came back. Hmm. Jay Pillar, what are the worst compromises made to get ships funded by politicians? Usually numbers. Numbers. Uh, Jay Rishan. Calling HMS Unicorn not a carrier and calling it an aviation support vessel like Jay Pillar. That's not a bad compromise. That's a very clever compromise. And especially when they don't realise it is a compromise. Julius C. Susan, the German ships are frustrating short range. Again, that's another problem for the British. Again, it's also a problem for the Dutch, you think, if they had it. Uh, Night and Protection. So this crisis was a military success for the British and French forces. International pressure, and most notably from the USA, undid that. What would the effects on both nations and their forces be without Eisenhower's economic threats and meddling? Um, it could have been interesting because Night and Protection, because, let's be honest, if they had been in there, it would have put them, suckered them into what would have been an ongoing issue in Egypt. An ongoing issue, but would have also meant control of the Suez Canal. Question is, would the money be worth, the money you gain from getting back control of the Suez Canal be worth the fighting? Uh, that's going to be the problem. Could have been interesting also from the effect on Egypt, because it could have ended up it would either cause one of two things. It would either cause them to permanently go into the Soviet camp, or it would have led to a sponsoring of a government being put in place who were more friendly towards the West. To govern. And then the British and French would have withdrawn. So it's a sort of interesting scenario, but it's, it's not fun if you're uh, Egyptians. New IKB 4 for 72. Scrap and keep guns for coastal defences or railway guns? I like railway guns. Mmm, railway guns are cool. Jeff Beeler, I was reading in Warship 2020 that World War 1 German light cruisers had 4.1 inch games, uh, 4.1 inch guns to appease politicians, not for, for, uh, for any good reason. Uh, I, I know that's definitely in Warship 2020. I'm not sure I agree with it as a concept. I think they had 4.1 inch guns because that was the best they could get at the time. New Camp 472. Channel Tunnel in World War II would probably be flooded, not blown up. Yeah, potentially. Probably a bit of both. After all, if you flooded it, could a scuba die? Uh, could some with sufficient oxygen get along it? That's the issue. Jeff Beeler, France lost shipbuilders in the trenches, so already built German Austrian ships made of sense. Agreed. Um, but. Mm. Yeah, ignoring Hood, how would you rank the World War I battlecruisers of the RN in Germany? Oh. Renown and Repulse definitely go towards the upper end because I like them. Mm. Okay, you've now been very cruel because I'm going to have to look up the name of the German battlecruiser next because I'm uh, my brain and my good old dyslexic brain is currently going. No, um, Well, I'd say Hindenburg is pretty good. So 
So I'd go Renan Repulse Hindenburg. Um, then Tiger and Queen Mary, the Fling and Lutzel. Sort of what I would consider them because, you know, the the Hindenburg is slightly better. I would reckon. I I I have always felt, but the the Flinger and Lutzel, Ratchin, sort of just uh, just about Queen Mary and Tiger, and then you're working down basically. Um, Von der Tam is definitely at the bottom of the list by a long way. Von der Tam is not really very good. It's neither, well, you know, it's just not what I would consider in times where I, I, I've never been that fan of Von der Tam because I think it has a lot of issues. A lot of issues. But that's me. I have a bit of a downer on Von der Tam. Mm hmm. Um,. Jerishan, just like, do you think rather than sort of selling off ships Royal Navy should retain the ships in reserve after being replaced? For how long do you think they should be retained? Again, I have put this forward. I have said, and I get into trouble for it. The Type 23s, etc., and things like Albion and Bulwark should be put in reserve. And I would have preferred if we'd had the bay, one at the Bay class we sold to Australia put in reserve rather than put into, uh, rather than sold off. I. I I, I don't know for how long, because in my ideal world, what would happen is you'd put some about six Type 23s into reserve, and then once you'd built enough Type 31s, you'd use the first six Type 31s to replace them in reserve, and you sort of start replacing them one for one. So the six best Type 23s would be held in reserve, and that sort of thing. But, you know, it's, like, it's, it's the way of it is. South Thompson, Clark, and Dr. Clark, why is everyone stuck on 10,000 tons for do everything ships? The Burke is 12,500 tons and the Daring's are 13,000, but the Type 20 doesn't fill. Daring's are 13,000? Which stats are you reading for the Daring class? Um, they're te at their most, they are 10,400 short tons. They are 9,400 tons fully loaded, usually, um, roughly. Uh, so no, no, not 13,000 tons. Zumwalt's are bigger. Zumwalt's are about 14,000 tons. And Burks are grown in these things. Basically, 10,000 tons is about the sort of level which you have the space to put the stuff in you need for an ocean-going ship. For an ocean-going ship, is about 10,000 tons. Um... Mm -hmm. I hear you, puppy dog. Don't worry. Um... I don't think the US has the means, willingness to dry dock and significant numbers. They do have dry docks, and we do have quite a significant dry docks. We could do things, but we wouldn't need to. Reserve ships don't need to be stored in a dry dock. Uh, they can be stored in a wet dock in a suitable basin, and we actually do have a fair number of those going around. We do have a fair number of basins, because we used to have a far larger navy which needed far more of these, and the infrastructure is actually mostly still there. It just isn't used. Hence, we have an entire basin filling up with nuclear submarines, which are too, which we still haven't started fixing, or rather retiring properly. Banham, how come the 4.5-inch gun was not kept by Australia and Canada in Mondays as they are ended? Working with the Americans, just going with the 5-inch, just going with the things that are available. They, the British decided to keep to the 4.5-inch because the British could. 
we had a large enough fleet to justify keeping our own. The others decided they'd go with the largest the manufacturer going. It was national pride sort of thing going on. Aeon 1003, can a propeller axle on a modern destroyer be damaged by ship-to-ship -ship collision? Unlikely. Uh, it's unlikely unless they get really, really rammed in the rear. Really rammed in the rear. Ronda, obey. Ships do not have automatic fire suppression outside of galley hoods and some small electronics. You mean the fixed fire sighting, uh, firefighting systems? Well, that, yes, but also actually some of the ships in terms, of especially when they're aviation ships and they have the big spaces, do actually have some automated fire suppression systems, which are part of them. Um, the higher risk naval warships do tend to have some automated system. Uh, well, not so much automated systems as auto uh, systems which are flash up in the CIC and you go beep, done, or in the damage control, uh, damage control center. They go beep and it goes on. A small blanket of water, etc., comes down or things on things. Hmm. Bishop, to invade the UK with men in scuba gear through the channel, we'll need a lot of men in scuba gear. A super bomb villain's army. Potentially, but I was thinking more about them ga gaining control of the end long enough that they could empty it and drive tanks through it. Jerison, why the flinger so low? Okay, so here's the point. The Flinger is so long because it and Lutzau are pretty much the same class, and I would say Hindenburg is better than them. Um, but I would say, and Hindenburg is to me better than Queen Mary and Tiger. But I would always put Renown and Repulse at the top because whilst they only have six inches of belt armor, they do have those 15-inch guns, and they are fast, and they are capable, and they're lovely ships. And they are true, definitely true battle cruisers. Um, and they can very easily outrun pretty much anything else. With Queen Mary and Tiger, they're both capable of 28 knots. The Hindenburg... The Lutzel, the Flinger, they're all capable of about 25, 26 knots. The Seidlitz is 28 knots, and the Gorbon is 28 knots, and the Mulk is 28 knots, but, you know. If you want to be a good battle cruiser, you need to be fast. There's no point being, depending on speed, and then not being as fast as the other navies. The Flinger and Hindenburg were the same class, theoretically, but Hindenburg is built third and she's modified. Samson, my mistake on bearings, didn't have my notes to double check. Don't worry. They, lots of people make mistakes about their time injuries some, sometimes. I got told the other day that, what was it? The Type 23s were 14,000 tons, and I was looking at them going. You mean Zumwalt's? No, Type 23s. They're about 3,000, 4,000 tons. Uh, yeah. This is what I know infrastructure wise is able. It's just willing to cover the cost of ships not doing anything. That's the thing. They have to be willing to do it because it's reservists. So they'd have to make, if they were planning on keeping them, they'd have to keep them, reserved. they'd have to put the money forward. That's the thing. Staff Tons and Dr. was thinking that 25,000 to 30,000 tons would be ideal displacement for all round do anything ship space weight. 
Uh, no, that would be absolutely. I, I can understand the idea for being able to do everything. Yes, that would be able to do everything, but that would be so massive it would be a World War Two battleship and practically a battle cruiser. It would be massive, um, and it would just get into. It, it would just be such a big target. And how many could you build? Where could you fit them? Where would they serve? These sort of things becomes an issue. Anton, CVN have a hangar firefighting control center with armored windows looking at a hangar. You don't trigger the air unless you absolutely have to. Air for bad for electronics and aircraft. That it is. I do agree. But uh, if you have to pick between aircraft and the ship, you pick the ship. Jeff Beeler, you're saying it used to have a bigger reserve fleet than you could, and then you could moor around San Francisco Bay on Google Maps. Mm, yep. New IK P4472. If the Channel Tunnel existed in World War II, the BAF might be able to evacuate with more of their heavy equipment, send trains for the tanks and big guns, and troops march back down the service tunnel. Hi, Colin Sad. Uh, Jeff Beeler, how dead are the old RN nuke boats? Jerison, if you make tunnels waterproof, you can add thousands of tons of stress to the structure. Um, yeah, that is true. DF, hey, Dr. Clark, what do you think of the upgraded LCS design for Saudi? Um, I think the Saudis will buy anything. Uh, no, I think for the Saudi Arabia, possibly it makes sense. Possibly. Because what they really want, do want is a mini book. And that's what that is. Basically, you're buying a Burke on an LCS hold, and that makes sense, but it's good for the Saudis. But it's like when I were talking about the US Marine Corps and they're adapting to smaller ships. If you're jumping into smaller ships, that's fine, but how, can, how are you going to run the logistics? Because you need to going to need a lot of logistics to support those units on the ground. And you can't bring everything in that small ship in one go. So it's going to have to go back. There's going to have to be a bigger ship not far away that it can go back to at sea, refill from, and go. Which, of course, the U.S. Marine Corps is planning on doing and works for them. But you can guarantee other Western nations are going to look at it and go, ah, the U.S. Marine Corps are using small ships, so we can use smaller ships. And you're going to have to sit there and try and explain to politicians, no, the reason we can't is because we have to take our equipment with us. They have these huge, great big U.S. Naval Sea Lift Command massive great big ships to bring their supplies up close enough that those small ships do not have to go far away to go get their supplies and bring back the logistics and run the logistics from. And that is going to be the problem. It's going to be logistics and it's going to be explaining it. Right then, I have heard now Puppy Wolf quite a few times, so I'm going to say I'm going to finish this at about 9 o'clock, because also the questions do seem to be sort of slowing down, so I can take Puppy for his walk, because he does sound to be complaining a bit. And he is lovely, but he has had a long day, because, well, if I swing it round... As you can hopefully see out there, we have scaffolding all around the house. And while we've got scaffolding all around the house, we've been taking advantage of it to sort some things out. And this has meant that we have... I think that's Montrose, or is that Richmond? Uh, my da uh, Richmond was one of my dad's babies, and so was Montrose. And I really loved it when... Um, I thought it was Montrose was up there, and I, it was another one of her sisters was going out to sea, and I was sort of going, yeah, they're, they're all my dad's um, little Type 23 frigates are going out there. And my dad's, one of my dad's things at the Type 23s is he got appointed, and they were already in production, and he went, um, are we quite sure about this? Why? They were looking at the flight decks, and he was going, are we quite sure about the strength points on these ships? I went, yeah, yeah, they're fine for aircraft. Have you noticed that the Merlins, the flood, the, um, Wheels, the undercarriages, the opposite way round to the uh, Sea Kings. And I went, huh? They designed all the strength points for the Sea Kings, which of course have their big wheels forward, their main weight bearings forward, and then a second, uh, then a little wheel back. Of course, on Merlin's, it's the opposite way round. 
and they have a far more balanced weight distribution, which means you need a different to re really redesign the strength deck of the flight deck. And yeah, that was one of the things he did on them. He did all sorts of little things on them, all sorts of little bits of future proofing. Thank you, Doctor. Just think everything's getting big again. I was thinking how very much or uh, why muck around. I agree. There is the idea, but I don't think it's going to get that big. Mainly because once you're getting that big, you are getting into World War II warship standard, battleship standard. <coughs> Ellen, do you think that Fisher's conclusion that led to the Invincible class was wrong? Should the armored cruiser continue differently? I like the blue I can see where Fisher's decision was coming from in the time he was in. But I think the trouble is the battle cruiser ceases to be sensible once you've got oil fired battleships like the um, Queen Elizabeth class coming online. Because the moment you've got something which is almost as fast but is a lot more armored, you've got problems. You have got problems. The fast battleship is what kills the. Yeah, Paul Johnson, does what, do you think modern ships are underarmed or are the weapons they carry so much more capable? Well, that's the problem. I do think, in, to an extent, they're a bit underarmed, but their weapons they carry are more capable. But the, the trouble is, I think you can rely, be over reliant on that. I uh, um, let's put it this way: there's the old stat I learned from the Falklands War. If every missile and weapon system had worked as well as its um, salesman had claimed it would work. Every single Argentine aircraft would have been shot down three times over, and every Royal Navy warship would have been sunk twice. I don't know how true that stat is, but it's quite a cool thing to remember. New weapons are very, very good, but they might not be as good as the salesmen claim they are to sell them. Well, we are considering destroyers 500 tons 100 years ago and frigates 500 tons 80 years ago becoming big. Yeah, they are. Greg Sussi, are you installing an armor belt on the house? No, a new roof. New IKB472. Show us the fluffy research system, please. He's downstairs wolfing. Wanting the guard. He's currently keeping mum and sister uh, mom and sister happy company. I will tell him you said hi, though, jean -Che. Actually, I do take a whole load of videos of him when I'm out walking. He's called the Prince of Puppies, and I send little videos to my cousins and to my family and actually my girlfriend's mum as well, um, because she likes to see him and what he's, get, uh, what he's getting up to. So there are all sorts of videos of him as the... Um, Prince of Puppies doing his sniff patrols. Slightly sad thing to admit, but you know. It makes them very happy. It makes them laugh, I think. Trent Lanker, regards HD6, there are not enough radioactive sources to x ray the heat affected zone on a four and a half thousand ton ship in less than a several years' time. Eh, probably. Distrustful. How much ERA would you need to mitigate an Exocet missile? Too much or way too much? A lot. Steph Thompson, it, in regards to the landing platform, I was under the impression that they had a honeycomb-style subframe because they don't know who exactly could be landing. And I understand about the BCs. Thank you. They do now, in terms of that is definitely the modern system. And that was certainly some of the system which was built by um, later on. But when they were 23 generation, they were being slightly different about it. Tell Raleigh he's a good boy and give him some fl uh, love from all of us. Thank you for sharing. I will, though. He's a good, he's a good puppy dog. The fluffy research system. Angston, if you post those videos of the pup up to you, uh, YouTube, you get de uh, so many views. Probably. Charles Johnson, Dr. Luck. So, possibly modern navies are just bed, uh, ju uh, just test beds and the sailors are expendable to the arms companies. We'd hope not. We'd hope not. Stephanie Wilson, let us see the poppy on Discord, please. I might put some pictures of him up there. I might do. Night Heron Production. My last question. If you could get Hood for refit in the mid-30s, 
Could she have been given at least a partial rebuild on long lines of repulse? And if so, could engines and armor be improved while retaining her original look in the way repulse did in the 36 refit? PS, I'm aware repulse 36 wasn't that comprehensive. Yes, she could have done. In fact, honestly, if I'd had my choice, I'd have taken hood in to refit in 38. If she could have been. But again, you've got to remember what's going on at this time. The British are dealing with issues with Japan over in the Far East. You are dealing with the Spanish Civil War, and all these things are keeping the Navy at a very high tempo. So even before World War II, you've got a high tempo going in, stopping them getting necessarily all the refits they want done. I'm saying at the time they want them done. There's a lot going on in the world. Don't worry about spelling, uh, Night Home Production. I'm dyslexic. I don't care about spelling. Life happens. Just make uh, the, It's the final draft which matters on the spelling, not the first draft. Take care. Have a nice evening. Um, thank you very much, everyone. It is almost nine o'clock, so thank you. Thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you to everyone who likes and shares these videos. Thank you to everyone who listens to Bill Trumps. Thank you to everyone who's pre-ordered my book. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord. Thank you to everyone who is my patrons. You are paying my book bills, which is frankly amazing and lovely, because as you can tell, I do get through a lot of books. I don't really get through them. I just acquire them and they never go anywhere else. And they're mine. Mine. They're lovely things. Um, the clock. Thank you for another great chat. Looking forward to watching what I missed in the first half. Safe walk. Best wishes. And the five researchers and my family. Thank you. Uh, it's Trump's fault. Real battle is to make sure your foes' arms come to as awful as you are. Technically, yeah. Take care, turning 3434. Uh, good night, Greg Sarsky. Uh, Strong Mac, thank you very much for your um, work tonight and good night. Thank you. Um, Sean Mac has been very nicely adminning the chat and checking on that. Um, so, everyone, please thank him. And Angus Sunnell, good night, everyone. Eamon, thank you. Paul Johnson, thank you. Jonathan Smith, thank you. Albert Smersky, thanks. Tis Transport, thank you. Kilo19, thank you. Take care. Stephanie Wilson, thank you. Take care. Uh, Tom Bemel, uh, take care. And Trenton Leco, take care. All right. It's nine o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. And right, let's go into this one. Oh, dang it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you for France. It is France's fault. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Donna Freeman. Thank you, Sean Mac. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Why does this fall behind? It's just weird. Thank you. Take care. 